There are few games out there that can offer the same experience as Prototype. There are sandbox games with better graphics, better mechanics, and even better stories, but Prototype has managed to withstand the test of time because it offers something that you really can't find anywhere else. You're not an elite soldier sent out to fight against a tyrannical government, you're not a 19th century western gunslinger trying to get rich, you're something else entirely. Something less than human, but also something more. You're a killing machine who wants to find out who and what you are, but most importantly, why. The first prototype game is considered a one-of-a-kind experience that you can't get anywhere else, and that's because no other open-world sandbox game really comes close to nailing its setting so well. The easiest thing to compare its setting to is Resident Evil, but there aren't so many similarities that it manages to feel like a cheap knockoff. No other game I've played is quite like it, including the second game, but we'll talk about that when we get there. First, let's take a deeper look at why this game is so loved, and why the second is so hated. Get ready to experience shadowy government conspiracies, existential questions about what defines life, and a frightening overabundance of edginess. There will be spoilers from this point forward. The last person responsible for all of this dies tonight. I'll be breaking down my criticisms into three sections for both games, mechanics, exploration, and story. This will help give some semblance of structure to this video since the story is such a tangled mess of information. First, let's get into the mechanics starting with movement. Traversing the city always felt good and you move at a pretty good pace. It always felt satisfying to jump from one building to another in quick succession or use an air dash to get some distance before gliding the rest of the way. Where this movement system suffers is whenever you need to have control over what you're doing. Fighting in confined spaces always felt like hell because of how little control you have when moving quickly, and it can often lead to you getting stun locked into a corner and then killed. If that doesn't happen, then you're likely to just blaze right past whatever you wanted to grab or attack, so high octane combat isn't a very good option. The next notable mechanic is stealth. Stealth in this game isn't very deep, but it does have its uses. By consuming your enemies, which is how you regain health as well, you can shapeshift into their form and disguise yourself. Wearing an officer disguise will get you into military bases that usually have a few guys you can consume to upgrade your proficiency with things like tanks and helicopters, and it can even give you the ability to call in airstrikes while disguised. Once you unlock the necessary skills, you can use a disguise to enter tanks freely without needing to hijack them. If you do set off an alert, then you need to run away or kill everyone in the area and then shapeshift in order to throw off your pursuers. There are various different scanners that can detect you if you get too close, but about halfway through the story you get an ability to disable them. I almost never did this because I forgot the option existed, but it is there. Military bases have literally no function other than you being able to destroy them to prevent enemies from calling in strike teams in combat. If these mechanics sound like they're a pretty solid foundation for some fun gameplay, then you can rest assured that the devs made sure to profit off them as little as possible in this game. There are only a handful of missions that require you not to break cover, and it isn't until the second game where you get missions that can be done almost entirely through stealth. Let's get into combat. The introduction shows off over half your abilities, so there's no reason to wait like I did in my God of War video. You have five special abilities that all have their own strengths and weaknesses. The claws are the first one you'll get, so they give you a much needed damage boost over your fists, but other than the spike ability, I see no practical use for them because of how little damage they do in comparison to others. You also have the hammer fist, which is your slow and hard hitting ability. This is useful against tanks, but besides some super expensive options that I never invested in, I never found much use for them otherwise. I'd sometimes use them over the claws in the early game since they did more damage, but even in the late game their damage output against the tanks is pretty low, but that's likely because I didn't invest in the aerial attacks like elbow drop. Next up we have muscle mass. This ability increases your regular melee and throwing damage, which gives a normal combat skill tree some prevalence if you decide to invest in it. Despite that, I think that this ability is completely useless because the damage output for melee attacks is still pretty low, and yet I needed to rely on this ability for all but one of the bosses. Next up is the Whip Fist, which is your long range ability. It has some uses with sweeping enemies, but really I only used it for grabbing helicopters so you can hijack them easier. Lastly, we have the Sword Arm. I use the Sword Arm 99% of the time because it is the single best ability in this game. It does more damage against tanks for a lower cost in the skill tree, it is just as fast as the claws with more than twice the damage output, and there is seldom a moment when you won't have a use for it. If I were to summarize the 5 abilities, I would say that everything is good at one single thing, but the blade is good at almost all of them. The only exception is hijacking helicopters with the Whip Fist and throwing things with muscle mass. But I generally regarded most of these abilities as completely useless. I don't see there being much depth for different builds in this game except for a muscle mass melee build, but I barely invested in a melee skill tree to begin with. In addition to these 5 powers, you have 2 defensive abilities. The first one you're likely to get is the shield, which lets you do things like this.
The next one comes at the same time you get the sword, and it's the armor ability. The armor is the optimal choice, but it has some downsides to it. Since it's heavier than your usual clothing, your movement is slowed and you can't glide, but probably the dumbest hindrance is how you can't dive roll. You only have one dodge in this game, the dive roll. It's already not very good because enemies can stun you just by spitting on you, so the dodge is almost a necessity if you want to avoid getting stunlocked by enemies like hunters who tend to just fling their arms in front of them and charge at you. I was playing the game on hard mode, and probably the most frustrating thing about the game was taking constant damage from little things or just getting repeatedly stunned. The armor offers good protection against things that would otherwise blast you for massive damage, but it comes to the cost of being able to avoid these more annoying moves in the first place. I don't see why this is a trade that you needed to make. The movement penalty makes sense, but why can't I still dodge attacks? The damage reduction is basically nullified by the fact that you'll be taking more damage, and yet I still felt the need to use the armor because without it I could get blasted from behind by a rocket and it would take a fourth of my health bar. If you watched my God of War video then you know how I feel about developers revoking defensive options for stupid reasons, and the same thing applies here. Dodging is a useful tool that the player should have access to at all times, and it shouldn't be something that you can only use conditionally. Thankfully, the second game has much better defensive options, so this issue only really applies to the first one. Lastly, we have Devastator Attacks. This is an ability that you can use if your health bar reaches critical mass, which is a small portion that caps off the meter. It is a single-use, highly damaging attack that destroys basically everything around it except for the toughest of enemies. There are apparently three different types of Devastators that can be unlocked by working through the combat skill tree, but I never figured this out for myself. Two of them are AoE attacks, and one of them hits a single target. They're not very effective against bosses anyways, which is the only time I would really need to use one except for the ability that lets you fire one off when your health is almost out. Altogether, this combat system puts off the impression of depth while actually feeling very shallow. Like I said, there's very little room for build variety, and the sword will almost always be the best choice for most situations. Combine this with the frustrating enemy hitboxes and the fact that you can get stunned if an enemy looks at you weird, and the combat starts to feel like a chore in the later game, especially on hard mode. I never felt like there was a skill cap I needed to reach, it was just about ending encounters as quickly as possible before something stupid happens. I don't feel the need to go too deep into what makes this combat system frustrating because the real culprit is the game's age. These systems were fine in a game from 2009, but we've seen much better since then, so it's hard not to compare them, especially coming from a game like God of War. Regardless, it's unfair to criticize a game just for being old, so most of my criticisms will be based on flaws in the combat and boss design, not its overall clunkiness. Next, let's talk about exploration. Manhattan is a large place, and you're free to move around it as you wish. You can infiltrate or destroy military bases, and you can destroy infected hives. There are also various challenges scattered around that include things like killing a certain number of enemies with a certain weapon, races, or hunting down and consuming targets that will fill out your web of intrigue nodes, which is something I'll talk about more in the story section. The challenges are alright, but I never found them very engaging, and there aren't any real side quests beyond them. Infiltrating a base is useful so you can unlock additional skills for weapons and vehicles, but it's not very interesting beyond that, and once you've done one, you've done them all. There's really nothing interesting to do during free roam, and I found myself running around looking for web targets more than anything. There's so little to do that I initially didn't even mention it until I played the second game, and then I felt like it was worth talking about so I can compare the two. Before we get into the story itself, I have one more criticism I'd like to get out of the way early, quest design. The story in this game is pretty good, I'd even go as far as to call it great, but the quest design isn't. Almost every quest in this game is either an escort mission, search and destroy, or a fetch quest. There are some exceptions that stand out, but the missions themselves aren't very engaging. The writers did try to incorporate the quest design into the narrative, and I'll point that out when we get there, but a lot of them aren't as interesting. There's no in-depth stealth missions with multi-layer infiltration, no busting your way into a heavily fortified compound and laying waste to everyone and everything, the inside of military bases are copy and pasted with the only difference being the enemies you face or where the door is at. I think a lot more could have been done with the quest design that would complement the gameplay, but if you're coming into this game expecting unique level design plus an open world like Arkham City, then you're going to be sorely disappointed. Most of the missions will only last about 10 to 15 minutes, but I can summarize what you do in less than a paragraph. There just aren't enough interesting missions for the moment to moment gameplay to feel engaging, and yet I still need to describe each objective because it does tie into the larger story. So, I'm warning you now that there are a startling amount of shitty jokes and puns during this section of the video, even more than I usually do. It helps make writing the script more interesting, so hopefully it does the same thing for those of you watching and listening. The game starts with a cutscene showing New York roughly after COVID broke out. This introduction sets the stage for what kind of character you'll be playing as. Meet Alex Mercer, resident terrorist and walking biohazard. He'd fit in well with most of the women on Tinder, I think. He monologues about how he is responsible for the state of the city, and he has no delusions about what he is. 
You learned that a lethal virus was released three weeks ago, and Mercer woke up in a morgue afterwards. He wants to find the person responsible for his current state and get revenge. The motivation doesn't seem very original, but it's intriguing nonetheless. You cut back to some soldiers who find a prostitute getting chased by zombies. They kill them, and then dispose of the poor girl too, so these guys certainly aren't the most noble bunch themselves. This cutscene does a pretty good job at showing just how much of a lethal killing machine Mercer is, as well as his ability to disguise himself. You then cut to the gameplay introduction where you're dropped into this absolute circus of death and destruction and you're basically given free reign to play around with the mechanics, albeit with some guidance. This sequence ends with you killing the nearby commander. Mercer then heads to a nearby rooftop where it's revealed he's working with somebody else. The identity of this mystery man is, well, a mystery. He says you have less than an hour until something goes down, and then you cut back to 18 days before with two morticians performing an autopsy on Mercer. One of them refers to him as something called Blacklight. He wakes up before they can cut him open, and they run out of the room saying to call the kill squad. Maybe you got rid of that old yee-yee ass haircut you got, you get some bitches on your dick. Oh, better yet, maybe Tanisha will call your dog ass if she ever stop fucking with that brain surgeon the lawyer she fucking with. Nick. He gets spotted by the most perceptive soldiers in the entire game and manages to survive getting gunned down by a firing squad. You escape and run through the city, taking down helicopters and consuming victims along the way. Doing this grants you access to their memories with imagery reminiscent of Black Ops. Technically this game came out first, but it's the first thing I think of when I see it. This tutorial opens what's referred to as the Web of Intrigue. The web gives further insight into the story as well as some of the side characters and helps explain some of the finer details. I didn't do the entire thing because there are 131 total and I already felt like I wasted my time doing all the riddles in Arkham Knight. From what I've seen, these memories range from genuinely interesting to complete filler, and some of them foreshadow events that have yet to come in a pretty heavy-handed way. The details you learn from these add context to the events of the story but generally don't do much else. You learn that the military is moving in on Mercer's sister, Dana, so you make your way to her apartment. An important thing to note is that if you're disguised as a commander and facepalm one of these underlings, then they just salute you and completely ignore it. If that's not an immersive military experience, then I don't know what is. You also learn here that the detection system in this game is really bad. You can jump, fly, or wall run in front of people, but as long as you're disguised as a soldier or don't shove them, then they just look at you and say, uh, yep, there goes Bill. Define the laws of physics again. What a great guy, that Bill. You head into Dana's apartment and kill the soldier keeping her hostage, then you both escape. She tells you that she hasn't seen you in about five years, and that you just showed up at her door last month asking to help investigate the corporation you were working for, Gentech. You both head to a safe house that belongs to Dana's friend, and she tells you that the military is probably waiting for you at your house, so you go there next. You make it to your apartment, and to nobody's surprise, the place was rigged with explosives. This doesn't kill you, so you set out to catch the person who ordered the bombing. You need to catch up to the convoy, and you have a choice of radioing an all-clear signal if you're incognito or attacking his APC until he's forced to get out of it. The end result is the same, and you find out that what gives Mercer his superhuman abilities is that he's infected with a weaponized virus that's responsible for the chaos we see in the beginning. There's also mention of a strain of this virus that broke out in Idaho in the past, and the current strain makes that one look like the common cold. You cut back to present day where Mercer is telling all of this to our mysterious ally that we've yet to meet. This is basically the flow of the game. You do a few quests and then get a cutscene of these conversations until you're caught up to current events. It's not a bad way of giving context to what you're doing and foreshadowing what's to come, but it does make structuring this video a little harder. Regardless, I'm not going to show every single one of these because not all of them are important or interesting. This scene helps flesh out Mercer's motivations as he explains that all he could think about was getting revenge on whoever did this to him, and that it was the only thought or feeling that he could truly say was his. He knew that Gentech was connected somehow, and since he can't remember anything about his past, he thought that tracking down the head of Gentech would give him answers. You cut back to right after you killed the bomber and proceed to Dana's safe house. She's going through your laptop when you arrive as she explains that it was mailed to her after your disappearance. You find a file that shows a girl named Elizabeth Green is being held in isolation at the Gentech building, so she's your next clue. You then get a cut to the headquarters of the special forces group you've been fighting, Blackwatch. General Randall, the rough and tough military leader who's missing an arm, tells the guy he's talking to that he doesn't care about excuses and only wants results. He then turns to the captain next to him and informs him that Mercer is in fact carrying a new strain of this virus and needs to be taken down. You head to the Gentech facility afterwards and man nap the commander so you can steal his face. This area introduces you to the bioscanners that can see through your disguise if you're in their vicinity. So here's how I do this. I don't have the stealth kill perk yet, and I haven't gotten to the point of the story where I can hack the scanners, so stealth is out of the question. I man nap the first soldier so I can steal his face, wait for everyone to quit looking for me, man nap the commander so I can steal his face, wait for them to stop looking for me again, and then run up a 10 foot wall and do a front flip over the barbed wire in front of like 8 soldiers. Nobody says anything. 
You head inside the facility and find Elizabeth Green. She attacks you when you approach her and imparts you with some vision of her being captured by Black Watch in New York Burning. Once she leaves, a dozen or so hunters are burnt out of these giant sacks and then attack. You regain control as Mercer is knocked out of the tower and he gobbles down on some poor private to find out where the nearest military base is. You lead the hunters there because they're borderline invincible otherwise and get to work killing the first one. Using some explosives in a room full of expendable soldiers gives you a chance to consume the hunter which nets you the claws ability, completing your Edward Scissorhands cosplay. This causes more hunters to spawn in, and more of them, and then more of them. By the end of it, I had like 8 hunters chasing me. I already went into how clunky the enhanced movement feels in close quarters, as well as how weak the claws are, so as you can imagine, this part is a nightmare. Having you feel this weak against hunters now does help you feel the progression later in the game, but I still found this part frustrating. You don't actually have to kill all of them though, as your next objective is to blow up the base by destroying the fuel tanks. This kills everybody in the base except for you because you're the protagonist of a video game. You head back to Dana and she tells you that your ex-girlfriend, Karen Parker, is in some need of rescuing. It's a good thing that Mercer here is suffering from amnesia because I have no interest in speaking to any of my exes, much less saving one of his. You show up and she tells you how she thought you were dead and then asks if you would kindly go get a tank. You eat a man which leads to you eating another man so you can learn how to drive an APC. You then ride back to Karen's house and destroy the hive so you can take her somewhere safe. One thing you'll learn in this game is that there is absolutely no penalty for collateral damage. I killed enough civilians on this playthrough to make the Bush administration jealous and none of the soldiers around me cared, but the second one of them stubbed their toe on my vehicle it starts raising my suspicion meter. Karen sends you on a fetch quest to collect genetic material for two distinct strands of the virus that will help in creating a cure. The first one comes from infected water towers that the hunters are using as incubators to reproduce, which I really like the concept of. The second will need to come from a hive, so you set out to do that. You collect the samples from the water tower and you collect the samples from the hive while defending it from the military. You collect the material and that's the entire quest. You don't even take it back to Karen, that happens off screen. I hope you're starting to see why this quest design throws me off. You head to Dana's safe house where she informs you of the location of Blackwatch headquarters. Mercer believes that the director of research at Gentech, McMullen, is responsible for what happened to him, so he sets out in hopes of finding him. Both Mercer and Karen had worked for McMullen before his transformation and he had been studying Elizabeth Green, so he figures that he's the best bet for getting the truth. The headquarters is a literal fortress with hundreds of soldiers outside at once, which means stealth is the game here. My impatience got the better of me, so I eventually just Jeepers Creepers his ass. You find out about some UAVs that are capable of detecting and tracking traces of the virus, specifically Mercer's strain, so you set out to destroy them before they find the safe house. You're then sent to destroy 10 more viral detectors posted on various rooftops. Once you're finished, you get another cut to Blackwatch headquarters where the captain from before is given a syringe full of something that they explain can incapacitate Mercer and create a cure simultaneously. The general gets mad when the captain calls Mercer he, even though it's never actually said in dialogue, and then you see that he's been reading up on the tactical nuclear weapons protocols. You head back to the safe house for another 30 second talk with Dana where she says that if you can infiltrate a Blackwatch research team, you should be able to get close to McMullen. He's been conducting research on the hives and has tasked a squad with decontaminating one to safer levels so he can study it. So you steal a face, disable the scanners, and radio the all clear so McMullen's chopper can land. Your plan goes awry whenever a wall of pimples starts spitting out infected right before he lands. You head back to Karen and she tells you that the material you gained wasn't enough and that you need to go inside a hive and get more. She then tells you that she's sorry it had to play out like this, likely referring to Mercer's current state in the outbreak in general. So, you make it to the hive and start collecting all the glowing yellow orbs, and get interrupted by Captain Cross, the guy they sent to stop you. Karen sold you out to Blackwatch, proving that she actually is the Karen I sniffed her out to be. Like, look at that haircut, how could Mercer possibly think he could trust her? Let this be a lesson to all the boys watching this. Exes shouldn't be trusted, and Karen shouldn't be tolerated. This boss is the fairest and most enjoyable out of all of them in the game, and it's literally the first one. Just dodge his rockets and attacks, and avoid attacking when he has his shock baton out and you'll be fine. You give Star Paladin Cross the smackdown until he tries to escape. I'd say that he deserves the beating he just got, but his rocket launcher kinda looks like a stick driver from Bloodborne, and I find it really hard to kill a fellow powder ganger that isn't Jura. Thankfully, I won't have to as he says a few trigger words to jolt Mercer's memory which stuns him for a moment, giving him enough time to inject him with a syringe. This is explained in one of the memories you collect for the web, detailing that regaining memories is a painful experience for Mercer and it should be used against him if possible. Cross turns his back for a moment which gives you time to escape, and whatever he injected you with is stopping you from using your powers, although your movement and disguise abilities aren't affected. You head back to the safe house where Dana has another lead for you. 
There's a doctor in town who McMullen has under Blackwatch surveillance named Raglan. She tells you that he would likely be willing to help, so you shouldn't kill him. She then shows you some information on an army town in the 60s, Hope, Idaho. In 1969, it was wiped off the map, and the official story is that it was the result of an anti-government standoff. The sole survivor of the incident was Elizabeth Green, who despite her appearance is actually 55 years old. Mercer says that the town was grounds for an experiment and tries to explain how he hears the screams of a couple hundred dead people inside of him. This understandably freaks Dana out, so he disappears like a ghost. I haven't brought it up, but Mercer is freaking edgy. I know back in 2009, the stereotypical life is grim e-boy persona wasn't as common as it is today, but damn, it really stands out now. You find Raglan and quickly put him to work trying to stop the virus. He agrees after seeing the massive glowing mosquito bite on your back and when Mercer shows his ability to make his skin all wavy. He tells you that he needs to find where the military is keeping patient zero, which means it's snack time. You chat on on one guy to find out that the commander has the information you need, and Mercer decides that the best way to draw out the commander is to slaughter his men. Except you don't have any powers. So what do you do? You steal a tank, kill the other tanks, run from hunters, eat 15 metric tons of human flesh, and shoot enough rockets until the commander arrives. Then you climb inside his tank and eat him too. You find out what you need and get another cutscene with Mercer and Mysterio. It's explained that the genetic material you collected for Karen was used to create a weaponized cancer that would cannibalize Mercer's body and produce a cure at the same time. I think this is a creative way of taking an otherwise boring quest structure and tying it into the narrative with a twist that you otherwise wouldn't see coming. The man also asks how it felt to go through that experience. Did you ever consider how the parasite felt? An intelligent cancer ripped from its host? Yeah, I did. Once. Right before I killed it. You head back to Raglan's place and promptly pass out on the floor. When you come to, he explains that the cancer is in fact producing antivirals to fight against the infected, and that he should be able to find a way for your body to fight back if he can get some time with Patient Zero. You steal a tank and take Raglan to the abandoned base where they were storing the first infected. This escort mission slams straight into a defense quest as infected pour into the room to attack. There are explosive weapons littered all over the place, but this quest is really a chore. You have to defend the lab against a legion of these Crackdown 2 Left 4 Dead rejects that are more interested interested in smacking the glass than eating your ass. The tough part about defense quests in this game is that you can actually friendly fire on what you're defending, so using a devastator attack in the later missions will cause you to fail because you destroyed it. Once you're finished, you escape while giant hentai abominations sprout from the ground to attack. You make it back to Raglan's where he tells you to find a hunter with a specific genome to inject your counter parasite into so it can produce antibodies, then consume it so it can cure you. I like how Alex goes, yeah, I've heard that before. I cannot think of a single moment that you've heard anything close to what was just said. Well, this requires you to use a helicopter, so that means... You use this multi-million dollar government funded flying machine to find the hunter you need then jump out of it because Mercer doesn't pay taxes and fight the hunter until you're ready to inject it. For some reason, this causes it to run off, so you chase it until it's ready to fight. This is something you're going to see a lot of in some of these quests, and it's a very artificial way to make them longer. There are some worse examples near the end that I'll point out, but I hate these chase sections because you can never do anything but spend upwards of 5 straight minutes following it. Once an arbitrary amount of time has passed, you can consume the hunter and get tackled by 8 or so infected for some reason. This causes you to undergo your chrysalis where nobody can see, and you pop back out with armor and a sword for a hand. I said I wasn't going to critique the game for being old, but man, the technology was just not there to make these cutscenes as badass as they try to present them. You make it back to Dana, where Mercer apologizes for being an edgelord, and she gives the standard, yeah, you're definitely one sick, disgusting, monstrous son of a bitch who literally eats people and stores their consciousness in a state of perpetual, eternal torment, and I'm not even sure if you're human or can feel anything by this point, but you're still my brother. A giant hunter busts through the wall and kidnaps her right on cue, and you get to chase it for several minutes straight before you're given a chance to fight it. Like, seriously, you chase this thing for like 4 or 5 minutes straight, and it's immune to all your attacks until you reach the trigger point. Then this UAV automatically calls an airstrike whenever you step in it that causes the hunter to get away. Again, this is a very artificial way for you to lose here. These UAVs have never been able to call in airstrikes, and it destroys the damn thing in the process. Why not just make the hunter maul you half to death and then toss you aside to really beef up the intimidation factor since normal hunters are strong enough to destroy tanks as it is? It's not like older games ever shied away from video game logic, but still, this is really stupid. 
You get another cutscene of Mercer explaining his plan. He still has the Black Watch cancer weapon, and Elizabeth Green is clearly baiting him for a trap. Since the infected operate on a hive mine, he believed if he could consume enough infected mines, he could establish a link and find out where Green is hiding. It's basically spoiled that she dies in this cutscene because Mercer talks about how the infected army is scattered and left without a leader, and all the infected leaders are dead, except for him. The infected aren't intelligent individually, but under the command of an intelligent leader, they can be organized and be much more threatening. You return to Raglan where he tells you that the bigger hunters act as pack leaders to the rest of the normal hunters, and by consuming one you can find out where the focus of the virus is. You head out to do so, and after very slowly beating down this tanky bastard's health, you find that it's immune to being consumed, probably because of how dummy thick it is. You decide to trap one so Raglan can take a look at it, so you lead it back to the abandoned base where you found Patient Zero and very slowly beat it into submission. I had a hard time with this until I realized that it has a recovery rate after it's done doing a slam attack. Once it's unconscious, you return to Raglan and he tells you that the hunter has developed a mutation to avoid consumption. It has two brains and two spines, so you need to step on two cracks and break both its backs in order to consume it. You do this and get to view its thoughts, which are about as easy to understand as a woman's. This nets you the infected sight ability, which can help you spot infected and is useful for seeing which water towers hold hunters from a distance. A group of soldiers come charging into this overrun, highly infested, abandoned marine base for some reason, and you get to show them how much you study the blade. You consume enough infected soldiers to link yourself to the hive mine and track down the hunter that took Dana. You find her location and get to see as a squad of tanks fail to breach the walls, so they get called back to bring in something heavier. This next quest is actually a pretty fun one. It's still an escort and defense mission, but you get to see this absolute monster of a tank destroy these hives in a single shot. You defend it for two out of three of the hives, and then a hydra kills the crew inside. Then it's your turn to hop in and finish the job. These thermobaric crowns absolutely destroy anything they come in contact with, which is probably why you don't get to use this tank ever again. Once you breach the main hive's walls, you get another cutscene. This one shows off just how disgusting Elizabeth Green actually is, as her body is basically oozing infected blood onto anything she touches. She's a literal walking bag of infectious diseases that would put some girls from my high school to shame. Mercer tussles with Elizabeth a little before stabbing her with a cancer cure. Her body rejects it and she pukes it up on the floor, which causes it to physically manifest as this 10 foot tall Supreme Hunter. I never actually knew that the Supreme Hunter was the cancer itself, but the wiki set me straight in that regard. This is the part where I talk about why this boss sucks dog ass. Its attacks are slow and hard hitting, but they also can't be reliably dodged. This isn't so much a fault of the boss as it is the combat system itself, so I guess I can't really hold it against this fight too much. The first time I did this fight, I did what I always do, armor and sword arm. This was an absolutely stupid decision that resulted in me getting pulverized several times. You do next to no damage against this thing as it is, and being within smacking range just isn't optimal. I decided to look up some help on YouTube, and the best strategy is running around and throwing things at it with muscle mass. I hadn't invested in muscle mass by this point because I regarded it as a useless skill, so this fight took me a while. I forgot that I stopped recording in order to look up some videos, so I went back and redid the fight and realized just how incredibly easy it is when you use this tactic. It's time consuming, but it's by no means hard either. There's plenty of debris and rubble to throw at it, and it actually does more damage than most regular attacks will. Eventually, some soldiers will bust in and join the party, and hunters will begin to spawn in, but other than that it doesn't change much of the fight. The boss will charge at you with a shoulder bash that follows you either until it connects or until you juke him, and he can send some spikes into the ground much like you can that will do an absurd amount of damage. With all the infected chasing you and the USMC busting in with tanks halfway through, I think this fight really suffers from too much going on at once. The fight against Cross was good because it was relatively calm throughout, there were openings for counterattacks, and you did a decent amount of damage to him. That entire philosophy just went out the window for this fight and every other boss fight in this game. I think that this boss could be great if it was just one on one, your attacks did a sufficient amount of damage, and his attacks could be properly dodged like Cross's could. I don't see a problem with spawning in some low level infected just so you can heal throughout the battle, but as it stands this fight is just a circus. But don't worry, it's not the worst boss fight in the game. That one is yet to come. You throw enough rubble at the Supreme Hunter until it receives critical brain damage and carry Dana out of the hive. As you leave, you can see that the Hunter isn't quite dead yet as it begins to regenerate after you step on what's left of it. You drop her off at Raglan so he can tend to her, and he hands you a map that he says just turned up with several areas circled. You head to one of the locations and find a burner phone under the phone station. 
This is the moment that Mercer first makes contact with Mysterio. He tells you that Blackwatch started a project in Hope, Idaho called Red Light back in 1969. They'd been studying the Red Light virus for years on animals and wanted a controlled environment to test it on humans. At first, nothing happened, but the virus found the perfect host in Elizabeth Green and quickly spread to the rest of the town. Forty years later, Gentech was tasked with working with a sample of the Red Light virus they called Black Light. The goal was to engineer a strain that could copy and combine genetic traits to rewrite a living creature's genetic code. He then reveals that Mercer isn't a human, he's just a living version of the Black Light virus. You'll learn about how he came to be this way later, but for now we need to stop Blackwatch from deploying a weapon against Mercer, which he claims will happen via aircraft. This is one of the few unique quests that break from the usual formula. You need to get a Blackwatch disguise so you can take this helicopter. Once you consume one of the nearby soldiers, you learn from their memories that Blackwatch has created super soldiers designed to fight stronger infected like Hunters, and of course Mercer. From here, you're tasked with assisting the military at various different locations until you're called back to base in order to infiltrate it. This has you doing things like providing close air support at a hive, dropping soldiers off at another location, and then providing emergency extraction in another region that is being overrun with infected. This is a welcome change in formula since it requires you to maintain your cover the whole time and not just run in and wreck the place. It also feels good to actually save some lives for a change. Once you're finished, you get called back to base where you attend a briefing of this new weapon they're deploying against the infected. You learn that Blackwatch has engineered a gaseous substance called blood tox that is only effective against strains of the blacklight virus. Mercer explains this later in the the game as being like a modern day Agent Orange. Blackwatch has plans to blanket the city with blood talks to effectively wipe out the infected by suffocating them. It's completely harmless to humans, and the commander mentions that you've been breathing it since you entered the room. Mercer starts going into a coughing fit, revealing him to be the imposter in ending your game of Among Us 2009. This version of the game is a little less child appropriate because it ends in you killing everybody in the base. Well, I guess the regular game's kind of like that too, but anyways. You can also destroy the blood tox blowers so you stop taking persistent damage if you're smart enough to think about it before dying, which I was not. Eventually, you'll go against some of the super soldiers, which can actually do a massive amount of damage to you if you're not careful. Once they're all dead, you escape the base and get another cutscene. Mercer explains the revelation that he isn't human was both freeing and damning. Part of him was relieved, and part of him died. It made him realize that Alex Mercer is just another role that he plays, another disguise so convincing that even he believed it was actually him. He realized that ground zero for the infection was at Penn Station, not the Gentech building like he thought. The virus spread quicker after Green escaped, but it was already released beforehand. He still doesn't have all the details, so he doubles down on his search for McMullen in hopes of finding more answers. You head to another phone station where the Arkham Knight tells you that Blackwatch is trying to deploy blood talks all over the city. You destroy all the blowers and return to the phone booth for another mission. The infected went underground whenever Blackwatch deployed the blood talks, so you need to defend a pump until it reaches Times Square so you can flush them out. This mission is like the helicopter one except with tanks, and despite its difficulty, I actually enjoyed it. It helps a lot if you've been infiltrating bases and consuming the targets that carry skill upgrades because having maximum effectiveness with tanks really comes in a pinch on hard mode. You have to fight off several Hydras that like to ignore you and target the pumper vehicle, but once you make it to Times Square you're free to start the next mission, which is protecting the pump against an onslaught of hunters until it gets all the blood tox underground. A cool detail about this mission is that the military will start to open fire on you until command radios in and tells them that defending the pumper is first priority, so you're free to help defend it without everybody chipping at your health bar. This is good too because this mission is also very difficult, but once it's finished, Elizabeth Green pops out of the ground as a huge Resident Evil monster beginning the worst boss fight in the game. Alright, let's talk about this boss. It took me damn near two hours to beat it. Not because I kept dying over and over, I think that I died like four times at most, but because the fight just takes that long. This fight reeks of the old school gaming philosophy that was shattered whenever Dark Souls came into the picture. That philosophy is tedium equals difficulty. Most of the things in this game aren't difficult, they just take ages to kill. Health bars are bloated, and you take significantly more damage for little things than you should. I'm talking a smack from a hunter stun locking you for over half your health bar in armor. Elizabeth Green shows more than any other fight in this game that the devs didn't really know how to balance their boss encounters very well. Here's a breakdown of her moveset. She can blast a highly damaging wave around her that can kill you instantly if you're too close, but this move is well telegraphed and easy to avoid. The screen will start to darken and she'll start glowing orange beforehand, so I think this move is alright. She can also summon green orbs that float around and will explode on impact, doing a small chunk of damage but nothing too crazy. They can follow you up buildings or around corners if they get a good angle, but they're slow and pretty easy to avoid. She can also shoot a projectile stream of rubble at you that does a sizable amount of damage if it connects, but it's easy to avoid if you see it coming. Her tentacles can take a swipe at you if you're too close, but I was always at a distance so that was never an issue. And finally, the game will have about 2-3 to three hunters on infinite respawn that will chase you around for the entire fight. 
No one of these moves are bad on their own, but the combination of them and the way she can spam them one after the other is what makes this fight horrible. The way you defeat her is by doing enough damage to all her tentacles for the head to collapse. You then run up and damage her until she goes underground, and when she comes back up her tentacles will have more health than before. The tentacles aren't hard to damage, but I don't see you being able to get close enough to do anything while dodging green orbs, rubble, hunters, and the military whenever they're called in. I've heard that this fight is very easy to cheese if you use cannonball on her from the top of a building, but if that's what you need to resort to in order to win, then is the fight really balanced in the first place? I did the supreme hunter technique of throwing cars at her until she collapses, but even that was time consuming and tedious. The grabs in this game have a 50-50 chance of not working or grabbing the wrong thing, and if you start charging a throw in the air, it will sometimes cancel if you touch the ground. The throw doesn't always go where it needs to or just won't damage her because the impact wasn't strong enough despite it being a fully charged throw. I think the fight would have been much better if the hunters weren't spawned in, because dealing with green is already annoying enough without having a hunter turn a corner at Mach 7 to slam me with damage and make me drop whatever I was just carrying. It's not like you need them for health either because they are infected literally everywhere and you could easily snag 5 of them quicker than you could kill 3 hunters, at least on hard mode. I think I only died to the actual boss one time, and every other time I died to the hunters that chased me around for over an hour and a half straight. The fight is just exhausting, and at no point did I have any fun. I'm sure you could make this fight go quicker if you get up close, but with death only a handful of mistakes away, I didn't want to risk getting sent back to the last checkpoint. As always, I'll let you guys decide if I'm stupid or did this fight wrong, but I still feel like this criticism is valid. Taking away the hunters that spawn in would go a long way towards making this fight feel a lot more balanced. Once the fight's over, and after I spent some time reevaluating why I did this to myself in the first place, you consume green. You get some imagery of people dying in Hope, Idaho, and watch as Elizabeth Green gives birth. Then the game tries to give you an epileptic seizure, but I won't show that part because if it could give me a headache, I'm sure it would cause problems for at least one of you. Once you're done getting molested in the eyes by flashing lights, Colonel Taggart calls for Blackwatch to retreat and says that the countdown for something called Firebreak has begun. Gee, I wonder what that could be, guys. You cut back to Blackwatch Command and see it getting overrun by infected. General Randall is pissed, as usual, because he didn't authorize the retreat that Taggart ordered. He then tells Cross that he's moving Blackwatch Command to the local aircraft carrier, the USS Reagan. He orders him to find Taggart and bring him into custody and says that he can only give him four hours, and beyond that, it's out of his hands. I think hand would have been a little more accurate, but whatever you say, General. You get contacted by our mysterious ally, and he tells you that he knows how you can find McMullen. He says that you're growing an immunity to blood tox, which is weird because it's never brought up before now, and he tells you to assault the blood tox facility, then take a dive so they think they have you. They'll take you to McMullen, and you'll get your answers that way. You do this in one of the more difficult assaults because the place is a fortress, and they take you into custody so McMullen can examine you. You finally come face to face with the man you've been hunting this whole game, and Mercer tries to go the intimidation route. McMullen reveals that Mercer was planning to release all Gentech secrets, whether as a whistleblower or extortionist it doesn't say, and he took the blacklight virus with him as an insurance policy. Considering that he had Dana researching Gentech beforehand, then it's likely that he was going to blow the whistle on the whole operation. Whenever they caught up with him, he threatened to release the virus if they didn't let him go, and then shattered the vial, resulting in him getting gunned down. This killed him, but the virus found its way into his bloodstream and revived his body to use it as a living host. But at the end of the day, Alex Mercer is dead. McMullen says that they were trying to crack the virus, but Mercer was only intent on bringing down the operation, only solidifying that he was likely a whistleblower. Mercer says later on that General Randall himself shut down the operation after numerous leaks were released to the public, and web memories show that everybody at Gentech was scrambling to avoid an indictment. McMullen then says that you're not really interested in your past, you want to know the truth about hope, that you really want to know the secret. He then turns the gun on himself and commits suicide to keep you from consuming him and learning what he knows. Looks like McMullen turned out to be a big McChicken. You head to your next contact location and get greeted by none other than Captain Cross, the man behind the mask. I'd say I was shocked, but it's honestly pretty easy to predict, because who else would have extensive knowledge of Blackwatch's operations and who else would be willing to work with Mercer in the first place? He tells you that Randall plans to nuke Manhattan just like he did Hope in 1969. Apparently, Randall was the officer in charge of containing the virus and is responsible for the city's annihilation. Cross needs your help to stop him, and in return, you'll learn the secret. 
He tells you that in order to get onto the USS Reagan, you need to find and consume Colonel Taggart to take on his appearance, since Randall wants Cross to take him in. Taggart and a defecting force of Blackwatch are planning to muscle him out of the quarantine, so you need to cripple his air power to prevent it. Mercer may not be happy to work with Cross, but I sure am. We here at the Stake Driver Gang need to stick together. You destroy all the helicopters in a pretty tough mission and then get another cutscene. This is when most of the information about Hope is revealed, so now's the time for me to share everything I know about the subject. Like I said, I haven't done the entire web of intrigue, so I use the wiki to fill in the blanks. Blackwatch's first use of the red light virus, the Carnival One project, was performed on animals and the results showed that it increased their intelligence. The Carnival 2 project was what happened at Hope. Blackwatch built the town and told its inhabitants that they were trying to create a self-sufficient town that could survive a nuclear fallout. They brought people in of various races under the guise that their experiment was progressive and inclusive, and then they started experimenting on the subjects with the red light virus, telling the people that it was a solution that would, quote, simulate fallout. The goal of this wasn't just to see what would happen if the virus was used on humans, but to create a bioweapon that targeted specific racial types. The people didn't question what they were being injected with and were just happy to serve their country. At first, nothing happened, until Elizabeth Green. Green's body was a perfect genetic match for the virus and therefore became the perfect host. She was able to control the infected as the queen of the hive and started taking over the town. Eventually, they decided that the best course of action was just to nuke the place, so Blackwatch secured Green and used her unique biology as inspiration to start a new bioweapons program, which became Gentech. One scientist describes that her body is a machine pumping out viruses that could wipe out humanity if they were ever released. Gentech was researching these and trying to synthesize a new strain of the red light virus, which became black light. Enter Alex Mercer, who worked for Gentech until he discovered the truth about his research and escapes with a vial of the black light virus. Blackwatch corners him at Penn Station, Mercer releases the virus, and it used his genetic structure to essentially hijack his body and come to life. Mercer isn't infected with the black light virus, he is the black light virus. It may be using his body, but Alex Mercer is dead, and now the only thing that remains is the virus. And in his ignorance, he released Elizabeth Green and infected New York. That's why she tells him that she's his mother, not only because that's what Blackwatch designated her as, but because she is the mother of all the infected. Honestly, this is damn interesting. You can make a case that Prototype is just trying to be Resident Evil, especially since Mercer's abilities look awfully close to the Ouroboros from Resident Evil 5, which also released in 2009, but the twist that Mercer is actually an intelligent incarnation of a manufactured virus that went half of the game believing it was human, it's very good. It sets the story apart from whatever you might argue it's trying to clone and gives it its own identity. But the game has one more mystery with this explanation. Elizabeth Green was pregnant with a child, and Mercer wants to know what happened to it. That's the secret they keep talking about. Who was the child? To find out, let's finish up the story. Cross tells you that Taggart's massing troops at a base so he can blow his way through the quarantine checkpoint. You destroy the base and then chase him as he attempts to escape in his thermobaric tank. This is another chase quest that is artificially extended by not allowing you to hijack his tank until the end. If you try, you just get knocked off, but don't take any damage. Once the game lets you, you're allowed to do the thing you could have literally done the second he left the base. Once you consume him, you find out that he was running because he believed the fight against the infected to be a lost cause and it wasn't worth the number of troops it was costing them. Once you have his form, Cross takes you onto the Reagan where Randall shoots you in the head. He gets the nuke ready for firebreak and basically tells Cross that he's going to kill him and leave the Blackwatch troops to die in New York so there aren't any more loose ends. Thankfully for our fellow powder keg hunter, Mercer is able to stop him by scaring the bejesus out of him. Randall tries to reason with him saying that only he knows the deactivation codes to the nuke and Mercer explains why that doesn't matter. You consume him and learn about what happened at Hope, albeit in the same cryptic way you learn everything else when these memories are concerned. The important thing to note is that the child was taken when the military captured Green and she bit him out of anger. Randall cut off his own arm to keep the infection from spreading. The real moral of the story is that Randall could have killed Green and avoided everything, but he instead seized her and her child and is effectively responsible for the outbreak. Once you're done, Cross grabs you by the throat, breaking my heart and forcing me to exile him from the stake driver gang. Except, this isn't Cross. This is a detail that I never worked out for myself and needed the wiki to help me with, but Cross is dead. Sometime after Cross contacts you, he's hunted down and consumed by the Supreme Hunter, who's been using this form to help you kill Randall. He tells you that once he consumes you, he'll be able to withstand the nuclear blast and can essentially live on as the last infected. I always thought that Cross was Green's child and that him turning into a Supreme Hunter was just his final form, but apparently this isn't true. I'd like to talk about the concept of this fight before we discuss its mechanics. I love the concept because not only is it a rematch against something that was trying to kill you from inside your body before it manifested in a physical form, it's something you fought back against and beat once already. 
The idea that Mercer, a living virus, gets to fight against the Supreme Hunter, an intelligent cancer designed specifically to kill that virus, is honestly really cool. It adds context to what Cross says in the previous cutscenes when discussing it. Did you ever consider how the parasite felt? An intelligent cancer ripped from its host? It in many ways gives off the same impression as Mercer, that although it's a monster, it's still intelligent enough to pass as a person if it's given the right disguise. This fight represents the antithesis of everything Mercer is, and I like that. It's very intense despite the criticisms I have, and it's cool seeing all these soldiers and helicopters try to take this thing down until eventually being ordered to retreat and leave you to fight it alone. Unfortunately, the gameplay just doesn't hold up. Naturally, this fight is tougher than before. Big SH hits harder than he previously could, and he is mutated to gain his own Devastator abilities, and fighting him head-on isn't a viable option. So what do you do? You Tom Brady missiles and helicopters at him that are scattered across the airstrip. This fight is incredibly easy when played this way until you get its health down enough to where a timer comes on screen. I hate this design choice because the devs designed this fight to favor a single optimal build and gave the finger to almost everything else, unless you want to get smacked around enough. If this was a serious one-on-one -on -one duel that required you to learn his moves and react accordingly like the Zeus battle at the end of God of War 2, I'd really enjoy it. Instead, you have this diverse list of abilities and powers, but the only truly good way to take him out is equipping muscle mass and playing this game like it's Madden 09 Bio Warfare Edition. Most of the criticisms of this fight are the same as before, but even with the timer, this one is easier because you don't need to deal with the hunters spawning in. The fact that all these missiles and rockets are laying all over the place shows that this is how the devs expected you to play it. You can beat him without doing this, I exclusively used the sword when I did a playthrough before, but the fight is much more manageable just throwing things at him. You just need to play it like you're fighting the hammer from regular show and hit him with any bit of furniture laying around until he dies. And then in the cutscene, Mercer just cuts his head off with the sword as if we could have just been using that the whole time. One interesting thing about this boss is if you lose, you do get to see an alternative ending where the nuke goes off and decimates Manhattan. The actual ending shows Mercer tying the nuke to a helicopter. He was either past the point of deactivating it or he forgot he has the code, so you Dark Knight rises it into the ocean and die in the explosion. The virus uses a crow as a host to rebuild itself back into Mercer's form, so even a nuclear blast wasn't enough to kill him. You get the final monologue, which goes like this. I looked for the truth. Found it. Didn't like it. Wish the hell I could forget it. Alex Mercer. The city suffered for his mistakes. For what he did at Penn Station. And whoever he was, that's a part of me. Because when I close my eyes, I see the memories of a thousand dead men screaming as I take their lives. Moments I'll relive forever. What have I become? Something less than human, but also something more. So, now it's time for my final thoughts. This was really hard to analyze in a well-structured way because of how fragmented the information is, but after reading it out loud, I don't think it came out as bad as it felt it would on paper. The second game certainly feels much worse. I think this game has a great story to tell, but fails in some of its execution. The individual concepts are interesting and unique, the twists are hard to see coming, and even characters like McMullen manage to be intriguing despite them getting next to no screen time. The issue is that you're given a minimal explanation about what's going on and everything else is piled behind the web of intrigue, which has its own fair share of filler. I think I discovered close to 60 or so memories and only about 10 or 15 were worthwhile, the rest were just junk. Sometimes I'd even get duplicate memories, so the system is a little buggy. If you do manage to fill out the entire web, you get a quest to go track down and kill Karen Parker, which I also don't agree with because you learn through some memories that she only betrayed you to avoid prison time, and she shows in cutscenes to have some level of remorse for what she's doing. Sure, she stabbed you in the back, but she did it begrudgingly and apologized before you walked into the ambush, and her betrayal netted you the armor and sword ability, which are the two most useful tools in the game. Anyways, I think the writers had a very good story to tell, but they just didn't convey the information to the player very well. Most of the missions aren't interesting, and some parts of the game are just downright confusing, like the Supreme Hunter being Captain Cross. There's no dialogue that explains this, you're either just left to figure it out for yourself, or assume that Cross is another Supreme Hunter. And the evidence actually leads to you believing that Cross is Elizabeth Green's child, even though he isn't. The story just feels very sloppy in this regard, because it unintentionally misleads the player into misunderstanding the plot. The bosses in this game are abysmal, and the only ones I enjoyed doing were the first and final. I went pretty hard on the final boss, but I do still think it's a good way to end the game and it's a thousand times better than Elizabeth Green's fight despite you being put on a timer. 
I think that this game could greatly benefit from a remaster or a remake that smooths out the roughness of the combat system, and maybe then it would be more enjoyable, but if you do decide to play this game, then I suggest that you just do it on easy to avoid the headache of constantly failing missions due to enemy health being so bloated. And yet, despite these grievances, I still think this game is good. Yes, it has its fair share of cliches, Randall's existence is a huge one, but under the surface, there's really something great about this game that sets it apart from everything else. I wish that it was conveyed to the player better, but I still find it intriguing and a good foundation for the franchise. But the writers must not have agreed, because Prototype 2 is about to change everything. Prototype 2 is generally regarded as the weaker game in the franchise. I don't necessarily agree with this, but I do think this game gave me some very strong mixed feelings. The story isn't as good as the first game, yet it's easier to understand what's going on. Combat moves and powers have been streamlined, yet they also managed to have more depth because of these changes. Bosses are more or less copy and pasted, but they're fairer and more engaging than the first game so they never felt stale. But above all else, the main story missions are much more enjoyable to play through than the first games. Prototype 2 is this strange hybrid mess of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay being much more enjoyable than its predecessor, but failing to make any of its content feel worthwhile with its main story. There's a lot more to talk about with this game despite it actually being shorter, so buckle up. The first thing you may notice is that you're no longer playing as Alex Mercer. James Heller is the protagonist of this game, and I'll get into his character more during the story section. For now, let's talk about movement. Traversal hasn't changed very much between games, but most of what has been changed is for the better. Most notably, pressing the jump button performs a dodge, and holding the jump button performs a jump. This is a very subtle change that greatly works in the game's favor as you now have access to a reliable dodge right off the bat, and it doesn't feel cumbersome to use. There was never a moment when I wanted to jump but performed a dodge instead, and vice versa. One change that I don't like is how they bound the glide button to the sprint button, and it automatically activates after an air dash. I always hold down the sprint button to keep the momentum going while trying to get around, and I would use glide sparingly to get a little extra air, but I ended up gliding much more than I wanted to in this game, especially when I was trying to stick a landing and keep running. Movement is also much slower in general, especially when running up walls, but I think that's fine because it makes fighting in enclosed spaces much more manageable in my opinion. Beyond that, the movement is basically the same as before. Next, let's talk about stealth. The stealth mechanics in the last game were pretty stupid, especially regarding the suspicion meter. Basic things like flying in front of helicopters and running up walls now fill your suspicion meter, but only by a little. This is fine because wall running is the best way to get in and out of fortified locations and the only way to get to some areas like rooftops, so having it completely off limits wouldn't be a very good idea. In addition to these changes, falling out of the sky and landing in front of troops like a meteor will fill your suspicion meter. Enemies that suspect you will watch you as you walk around, which affects how you can stealth consume. The stealth consume isn't a separate skill anymore. It's the default option if you're not in an alert. In the previous games, you couldn't stealth consume if you were being watched, but in this game, it's the opposite. Heller has the ability to send out a vision pulse that shows him who's free to be stealth consumed and who's being watched, and aiming at the target will show you who's watching them. This adds a layer of depth to the system as you now need to plan your targets and eliminate them one by one until you can get to who you want to consume. If this feels too tedious, then you can still grab them and cause an alert. As much as these changes are good for the game's stealth, I found that it can be exploited if you bump into a target to raise your suspicion a little and then consume the person you want when they aren't looking. If your target isn't a soldier, then you can push them around without penalty and escort them out of everybody's line of sight so you can consume them, so it's not like the system is perfect. I had a lot of fun with the stealth in this game and it encouraged me to get creative while using it, like consuming a group of soldiers guarding some scientists and then gunning them down instead of just killing them outright, and you get a power halfway through the game that lets you turn people into literal bombs to cause a distraction. In addition to this, bases that you infiltrate for the story now have unique layouts and several layers of security you need to get through, and they can be done 100% stealthily. It's honestly a lot of fun, and I used it much more than I did in the last game. Let's talk about exploration. The game is separated into three zones. The yellow zone, which functions as a quarantine zone, the green zone, which is meant to be free of the infection, and the red zone, which is Manhattan and crawling with the infected. Each zone is split into various sectors, and each sector has their own list of things to do and find. In the first game, your only reward for exploring was finding glowing orbs that either net you some XP or an in-game hint. You know, those things they usually put on loading screens? There weren't any side quests in the first game, and I was never interested in the various challenges scattered around the map. 
It gave off very strong Crackdown 2 vibes, except even in that game, completing a race increased your driving skill and unlocked new vehicles, so it was worth doing. This game absolutely nails the exploration aspect, even better than Ubisoft in my opinion. In most open world games these days, like Far Cry or The Witcher 3, the map will be littered with these little checkbox filler tasks that aren't very interesting. Bethesda does this differently by having you discover locations as you approach them with no prior knowledge of where they are without a perk. Prototype 2 is more like the first example with the execution of the second. There are only three different things you can find in the world, black boxes, field ops, and infected layers. These are marked as collectibles in the game, and they filled a time waster checkbox category. Finding or completing all of these in a sector will grant you a specific mutation, which is this game's version of perks. I didn't find all of these, but I did find at least two thirds before I beat the main story. The black boxes serve as this game's version of the web of intrigue, although you don't unlock any interesting information about the story or a secret ending. There are short transmissions from Blackwatch that give some insight into what's going on in that zone. The field ops are a little more basic, it's just a site where Blackwatch and Gentech are studying some infected or something, and all you need to do is arrive and kill everybody to complete it. The layers are the more interesting ones, and they serve as small 1-2 to two room dungeons that can be completed rather quickly. They're a fun detour that don't overstay their welcome. You can find these collectibles while out exploring, or seek them out on your map. Instead of marking exactly where they are, the map will pulse their general location and leave it up to you to find it. If you've already discovered a lair or a field op and haven't done it yet, then they'll show up on the map afterwards. I found myself seeking out all the collectibles in the yellow and green zones until I got a majority of the perks I wanted, and I ended up finishing the main story with only about a fifth of the red zone completed. In addition to these collectibles, you can find skill upgrades. These function more like the web of intrigue from the first game and how they aren't marked on your map but appear on the mini-map when you get close. These involve you consuming people or infected to increase your proficiency in weapons and vehicles or upgrade your powers. Since you don't upgrade your powers with XP like in the first game, finding these skill upgrades are always rewarding and can give you things like increased damage, attack range, or significant power-ups. The last thing to talk about for exploration are the side quests. These start by you accessing a Blacknet terminal. If you've already found and consumed the required person while exploring, then you can just start the mission right away, and if not, you need to track them down first. This is where your vision pulse comes into play, as it not only functions for stealth, but is used to hunt down targets. You send out a pulse, and it's sent back to you from your target's location, so you follow it until you find them. Once you consume them, either stealthily or otherwise, you get the mission details from their memories, so you don't need to backtrack to the terminal, which is a good way of respecting the player's time. These quests range from you showing up and destroying something, consuming a specific target, or completing a race against time, which were the oddest and least exciting of the group. Each quest has its own little story that helps contextualize what you're doing. The races in particular are about collecting a load of crates that were dropped from a crashing helicopter, although the amount that you have to collect would make more sense if it was a plane crash instead. All in all, the side quests are fun ways to level up and take a break from the main story, and if none of this is to your liking, there's still challenges in this game too. You can tell by how long this section was just how much more there is to do in this game compared to the first. Lastly, we have combat. The combat systems in this game are a significant upgrade from the first, even if their systems have been streamlined. Let's start off by talking about the upgrade system. I already explained how perks and skill upgrades are acquired, so I'm not going to go too deep into them as they're really just number tweaks and stat bonuses, but let it be known that the mutations alone have six different sets of perks to choose from. The system has moved from the old set of upgrades that you take as you please to a more Fallout 4 style perk sheet, complete with their own little drawings, which is how I made that connection. The most useful perks I found were making yourself immune to small arms fire and hijacking vehicles and entering layers 75% faster. In addition to these changes, your critical mass meter has been reworked from being something that caps off your health bar to having its own separate bar, which makes filling and using devastator attacks less tedious. Some other notable additions to combat are being able to rip the guns off tanks and helicopters so you can shoot their own rockets at them, vehicle finisher moves that destroy them instantly, and, of course, turning enemies into literal bombs that shoot tendrils out of their body and pull them back in with whoever was unlucky enough to get caught in the crossfire. You can perform air grabs that have you pouncing on your target and air consumes that help you keep going without needing to stop. These two features were sorely missing from the first game. All of this has been added and we haven't even talked about the actual fights yet. In addition to having access to a dodge roll, you can wait until an enemy is in the middle of an attack to do a flip over them and continue attacking from behind. This completely eliminates the chance of getting stunlocked after performing a dodge and made fighting hunters much more engaging. 
you'll eventually unlock a shield that can be used to parry enemies and deflect rockets at specific targets like helicopters, and you can cut the arm off a hunter if you manage to parry them or just slam them into the ground for some bonus damage. Attacks themselves have been streamlined to only feature light and charged attacks for the air and ground. For example, on PS4, hitting square with the claws will start a regular combo, but holding square will cause you to pounce on them like a puma. Abilities like the hammer fist can do a dive bomb from the air to slam into tanks for massive damage, and the hammer fist now includes the spike ability that the claws had in the first game. Because these systems were streamlined, you can now equip two powers at once. In my case, this would be one power for the square or triangle buttons. These powers don't synergize that much, but you can do some hybrid combos with them that feel very satisfying to pull off. All the powers in this game return from the first game, except the tendril ability has replaced muscle mass and it's actually much more useful, especially against tanks in the early game. Each power is viable in their own way, so even if this game doesn't encourage unique builds any more than the last one, you'll likely end up picking which powers you enjoy the most and sticking with it instead of resorting to your sword arm for almost every encounter like I did before. So with general improvements like these in almost every area, why didn't people like this game? Well, truth be told, the story is a hot mess. There is a dramatic change in tone between this game and the last, and it's mostly due to how the writers handled the forces at play. In the first game, Blackwatch was a sinister and shadowy Black Ops organization that would stop at nothing to stop the viral outbreak. They were the ultimate utilitarian ends justify the means group that was doing the wrong thing for the right outcome, but they were only the brawn. Gentech was the brains of the organizations and were also the public face for Blackwatch's operations. The reason that their experiments went unnoticed for 40 years was because they stayed under the radar, working in secret until their efforts were exposed after the outbreak. They were very calculated in the first game. There's even a memory from a Blackwatch commander saying that the only reason the Marines were called in was because they could shift the blame onto the military if the city was burned to the ground. They were a convenient scapegoat. Nobody knew the origin of the viral outbreak because people like McMullen would take their secrets to the grave. By the end of the game, only you know the truth, but it's concealed from the rest of the world. Blackwatch and Gentech were grounded, almost realistic in their machine-like efficiency, and there's never any real accountability for their actions. Other than saving New York and sating your curiosity, nothing else really changes. So how are these groups handled in this game? Well, they're comically evil. You can find several black boxes in this game that detail Blackwatch soldiers opening fire on civilians. Gentech captures citizens from the quarantine zone and performs experiments on them, people are locked in cages in broad daylight, and they release hunters out in the open to see how quickly they can kill people. It's no coincidence that they've been redesigned to look like Wolfenstein Nazis. There are numerous black box recordings that have Blackwatch soldiers speaking with Deep South country accents as a way of communicating that they're uneducated and stupid, because somehow the devs think that country accents automatically make somebody an idiot. Don't believe me? Listen to this shit. Shit. Driving one of these things ain't no different than my old 4x4. Come on. You know, it's a little different, Bertram, because you never had flesh-eating mutated creatures jumping on your old 4x4 and trying to eat you. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Sarge. You ain't never met my cousin Belvis and Buford. I just wanted to be known that that got through several gatekeepers, and nobody at Radical Studios stopped and said, uh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't include stereotypes in our game. There's a guy who makes the comment, I signed up to shoot people, not monsters. Where did they find these people? Twitter? You hear a recording of soldiers gunning down a woman's autistic son as she begs them not to because he wouldn't speak to them. Another one of a commander gunning down his own man for getting bitten by an infected, and he sounded more inconvenienced than distraught. Patterson, move your ass! They're right behind you! Oh, fuck. And they just generally come off as the goofiest group of stupid villains you could find. And Gentech isn't much better, as the scientists lock people in a room with a huge infected that smashes things for fun just to see what'll happen. They have loudspeakers that broadcast messages that indirectly call themselves stupid and show how all they really care about is money. Gentech was never a greedy organization, they just wanted to create an experiment with lethal viruses in hopes of producing a weapon. The writers turned the Yellow Zone into Hope 2.0 and it just doesn't work. Blackwatch and Gentech have proven to be way too smart and conniving for them to come off as so incompetent. This whole thing could have been fixed, the game just didn't take place in New York. They could have put it in a foreign country with their own version of Blackwatch that was inspired by the effects of the viral outbreak and tried to replicate it, and at least then you could justify how incompetent and ruthless they are. There would need to be some restructuring for the main characters and some story aspects, but it would be worth it to not have these issues. 
The game only takes place one year after the events of the first one, and as an American, I understand how quickly a government organization can self-destruct, but this still seems like an unrealistic progression. But it's also not the only one. The game begins with a montage where you hear a conversation between Sergeant James Heller, our new protagonist, and his wife. He was on tour in Iraq whenever another outbreak of the virus began. Heller's returning from his tour and his family is killed by infected before he arrives. Mercer is officially pinned as the source of the second outbreak, and they've taken to calling it the Mercer virus. The next portion of the opening flashes Heller's profile on the screen as you watch him menacingly sharpen his knife while riding in an APC with several other soldiers. He was diagnosed with PTSD, has no regard for his own safety, and of course has a homicidal fixation on our boy Mercer. He requested to be posted in the red zone, and the psychiatrist recommends that he be placed on indefinite leave. Despite this, casualty rates are through the roof, so Heller is reinstated and assigned to the red zone. I'm not sure how I feel about the black, white, and red filter over the cinematics, but it isn't too bad. Your APC gets destroyed when a car comes flying at it like that episode when Spongebob shoots a station wagon at Patrick out of a cannon. When you come to, everybody is dead. Heller grabs the radio and starts checking for survivors when Mercer drops in. Ninja 3-3, three, three, this is Red Crown. We're sending reinforcements to your location. Do not pursue Mercer. Repeat. Red Crown, be advised. I'm not in fucking Black Watch. Heller's little sneak attack doesn't go according to plan, but that doesn't stop him. After getting laid out again, he chases Mercer further into the demolished streets. It's honestly quite a sight to behold with these red tendrils growing on buildings. This section isn't lacking atmosphere, that's for sure. You show up in time to watch a hunter maul another soldier to death before running off. They're technically called brawlers in this game, but that name is stupid, so I'm calling them hunters because that's what they are. A helicopter arrives to tell you that you're trespassing on Blackwatch territory, and Mercer destroys it. You're then greeted with the girthiest infected we've seen since Elizabeth Green, and you're forced to run to safety. You're not given much time to catch your breath as a hunter grabs you shortly after, and Heller stabs him to death with his knife. You really gotta appreciate the balls in this dude by this point. The rest of the scene is played out in a cinematic as Heller once again charges Mercer just to get pinned to the wall. He loses his knife after furiously stabbing his tendrils, and Mercer stabs him with his claws, injecting him with something in the process. You then see a doctor performing surgery on Heller, and hear a colonel tell him to run some experiments on you. You wake up in a room where these take place as they start releasing the infected. The doctor running the experiment is named Koenig, and the two commanders are Colonel Rooks and Lieutenant Riley. They deem you too dangerous to keep alive and activate the burners to scorch the room, hoping it'll kill you. Honestly, the dialogue of the scene is pretty good. It's not spectacular or anything, but it's a step up from the cut and dry military talk of the last game. Daniel Carroll, this is no place for your brand new bomb. Don't get sanctimonious with me, you fucking ghoul. I've read your experiment reports. You consume the soldier to stay alive as they keep trying to kill you, then throw a table through the window to escape. Mercer arrives and tells you that you've been infected with the Mercer virus and that Blackwatch are the real culprits behind its release. It's important to note that Mercer's voice actor has changed, and I don't think that the new one is much better than the first, especially whenever he mispronounces Koenig's name later. He has you consume a Blackwatch lieutenant as proof that they invented the virus, as the doctor in the memory says he was on the team that created it back in 1964. He then tells you that he isn't responsible for the death of your family and tells you to consume the DNA of the monsters that Blackwatch are creating with the virus. In the next scene, Heller starts a fight with a Blackwatch commander for no other reason than because he was rude to him, and you try to find a reverend that Heller knew at the local church, Father Guerra. You find him, and he tells you that Blackwatch has been experimenting in the Yellow Zone by doing all those heinous things I mentioned before. You know what I mean, infecting healthy citizens, putting them in cages with monsters, typical evil villain stuff. Heller is intent on stopping them, so you hunt down the local commander. This is when you're introduced to the hunting pulse, so most of it is just tracking down these yeehaws and gobbling down their memories like a TV dinner. Heller finds out that it was Colonel Rooks who was trying to have him killed before, but he fails to track him down with his sonar ability because he's a noob. Father Guerra tells you that they're going to release a hunter in a local park, so you show up to stop them. You beat this goofy bastard down because fists are a viable weapon in this game, and you get the claws ability right after. They release more hunters to distract you while they call on a capture team, and you kill them too. You kill all the soldiers and destroy an APC, which restores Father Guerra's confidence enough to start working on bringing down Blackwatch. He says that he doesn't entirely trust Mercer, but as long as he's intent on destroying Blackwatch and Gentec, then he's with him. The story in this game usually gives you two different quest chains to follow, and they let you decide which order you want to do it in, so you'll notice at times that the events I'm describing may seem non-linear. That's just the order I decided to do them in, so it's not an issue with the game's pacing like it may appear. Father Guerra tells you to check out a Blacknet terminal so you can find out what they're up to, and this is basically a side quest tutorial. You track down a Gentech doctor, give him the brain suck, and then get to work infiltrating your base. You get inside, steal a face, and munch on another doctor further in. 
These missions are more interesting in this game because there are several layers of security to get through and the reworked stealth makes them an actual challenge to get through without getting caught, even if the challenge comes from my own patience. Heller emulates this as he quickly loses his temper while trying to access a computer, and the conversation is surprisingly similar to when I try to help my friends with their PC. I'm pressing the red button. Shit. Now the screen's all fucked up. Shit's broken. Terminal 4 is currently logged on with no personnel present. Please return to your station and commence proper logout procedure. Fuck off. I hate computers. Once you leave, you move on to infiltrating a briefing that Colonel Rooks is having at his command center. Once inside, he tells you that Gentech is planning to run some high-risk experiments on civilians and that you can expect a body count increase. He then tells you to report to a Dr. Schaffeld. Heller decides to let the Colonel live instead of gunning him down because he can learn more about Blackwatch's operations if they think he's one of them. Heller blows his cover in order to stop this experiment and you gobble down on the scientist. A cool thing to note is that you can still accidentally kill priority targets in this game, but you'll only cripple them first so you can't just one-shot them like you could in the first game. Once you consume the science team, Dr. Schaffeld reveals his location over radio so you hunt him down too. I love the dynamic between Blackwatch and Gentech in this game, as you'll soon find out that the soldiers hate dealing with the scientist. I need an armored transport for Dr. Sheffield now! This is call sign Viper, ready evac for Sheffield ASAP, over. No, not ASAP, right now! Sheffield is crucial to Dr. Burke's research! Roger that! ASAP! You destroy his APC, consume him, and then move on. Rooks gives you a call as he still believes you're under his command. He says that the scientists are doubling down on their weaponization programs after what you did. He's sending you to protect the facility that they're working at. You sneak into the research post where they have a hydra contained. Your presence disturbs it for some reason and it breaks free of its restraints and then you kill it. Once you do, you get access to the tendril power. Dr. Bellamy isn't happy about you killing his pet and you demonstrate your newfound love for hentai by forcing a giant tentacle group hug and cutting everybody in half. At least I think that's what happens, I don't watch that shit. Bellamy radios Dr. Burke, his team lead, and says that he doesn't feel safe anymore and that he needs to be extracted. You get a call from Father Guerra for your next mission where he says he re-established contact with an old informant of his named Athena. You find out about another civilian test site, so you sneak in and Heller lets his edginess loose again. You wanna know what happens when you put people in a room with a monster? I'll show you! You kill everything in sight, consume a scientist to proceed to the next area, and find yourself face to face with this dummy thick lad called a Juggernaut. You eventually beat it, and once you consume it, your game crashes. After going through the mission again, except for going the stealth to save time, you consume the Juggernaut and get the shield ability. With parries back on the menu, you move on to the next mission. Rooks calls and tells you to escort Dr. Bellamy to the green zone. You destroy Bellamy's helicopter and force him to take an APC, and as you can imagine, that doesn't go too well either. Why did you take this route? It's left us totally exposed! When you're driving, Doc, you can make the decisions, but right now, you turn Bellamy into a protein shake and find out that Rooks was using him as bait in hopes of catching you alive. Obviously, it didn't work, so you move on. Your next quest has you getting a call from Father Guerra where he says that Blackwatch is trying to storm the church. You make it there in time to show them all the wrath of God and then evacuate Father Guerra. He says that he's moving to the green zone and that you should meet him there when you're finished dealing with Blackwatch. You then decide to track down Dr. Koenig to get a little revenge for how he treated you earlier. You infiltrate the facility, consume the soldiers one by one, release some hunters, realize that you need to fight them alone and you can't blow your cover or else you lose your bonus, kill them with your fists, and consume them to get a tendrils upgrade that has Heller automatically transforming into his combat form. Thankfully, all the soldiers were already dead so there was nobody to start an alert and I get to keep my bonus. That's just tactical thinking, boys. You bust into Koenig's office where he tells you that Gentech is forcing him to work for them and that the guild will eat him alive if you don't let him help you. He informs you of a Project Orion that is meant to design super soldiers to kill Heller with. He sends you to destroy one of the facilities that are manufacturing these soldiers, telling you that they haven't managed to successfully create them yet. Well, surprise, there are super soldiers here and you need to fight them. You ripped my friend limb from fucking limb and now I can do the same thing to you. You rip him limb from limb and proceed to destroy the facility. Apparently, these soldiers were only the Phase 1 variant and they still have one successful Phase 2 soldier. Dr. Koenig finds out where they're keeping the soldier and sends you to kill it. This soldier is made from DNA taken from Heller so it shares a lot of his qualities, including his voice. He turns out to be a pushover because parrying in this game isn't hard and you unlock your Devastator attack when you consume him. You kill several other hunters in the process before finally consuming Dr. Burke, where you learn that Dr. Koenig has been playing you. He knew that Project Orion was active and was trying to get you killed. This is honestly kind of stupid because he basically caused the destruction of the entire project with the hopes that it would stop you and then sent you after the one successful Phase 2 soldier they had. You'd think it would have stalled for time so they could get more, but you'll see a lot of stupid things in this plot. 
Kerning sends a kill squad to you because apparently he thinks that regular people can do what his Bane cosplayers couldn't, which of course doesn't work. You find his location from the commander and flush him out by destroying the fuel tanks to cause a fire. Kerna gets in the gunship and calls the pilot a dumbass for trying to evacuate him. You destroy the helicopter and get your chance to kill him. Well, nothing is that simple as it's revealed that he's like you and Mercer. In fact, he's working for Mercer and just wants to kill you to prove that he's superior to you. This starts your first of many fights against Evolved as they're called and honestly, I like it. I went really hard on the last game for shitting the bed with their bosses and even said that the final boss could be a fight that has you learning attack patterns and responding accordingly. These fights may feel copy and pasted, but they were still fun because they took effort in order to beat, at least on hard mode. The parry is useful for getting an opening to attack, but close range attacks will result in you getting countered immediately. Regardless of how much I enjoyed these encounters, I do still need to point out that there is very little variation between them and they can start to feel monotonous because of the limited attack options. Once you defeat the Mad Doctor, you learn that Mercer has been recruiting these Evolved from within Gentech's leadership structure, and that a girl named Sabrina Galloway, who you've heard a couple times from the Doctors you've consumed, is in line for CFO. Mercer says that it needs everybody ready for their plan in the Green Zone, and then appears after the memory to tell you how mad he is that you killed Koenig. You can really tell how much he mattered to him by the way he mispronounces his name. I needed Koenig, and you just took him out. Like swatting a fly. Mercer tells you that the Evolved are in Gentech, Blackwatch, and just about everywhere else. He wants to mass an army to wipe out Gentech and Blackwatch for good. Heller questions if he has plans to eradicate the virus, and Mercer says it's all in the plan. He appears to believe this until Mercer is out of earshot, where he calls him a liar. Father Guerra calls right after and says that you need to come to the Green Zone because something big is about to go down. He tells you that he got to the Green Zone by bribing a Blackwatch goon to let him hitch a ride on one of the helicopters. Heller decides to take a more hands-on approach by replacing one of the passengers. The pilot tells you that the infected are starting to breach the Green Zone. He also tells you that Lieutenant Riley called in extra troops for a briefing and he assumed you were here for that since you're disguised as an officer. You track down Father Guerra so you can discuss what you learned. One of Athena's contacts was able to pinpoint the source of the second outbreak, and lo and behold, it's at Penn Station, just like before. Surveillance footage shows that Mercer was the one who started the second outbreak by using spores from his own body, so he actually was responsible for the death of Heller's family. This makes the term Mercer virus seem less like a scapegoat and more like a description and fires up Heller's revenge plans all over again. I'd say this twist is hard to see coming, but it really isn't. The writers have been posturing Mercer as the bad guy for some time now, and while I'm glad that Heller isn't naive enough to simply believe him, it still isn't surprising when you get to this point. I'll go into more detail about the various villains in this game after we finish the story, so let's just move on for now. Heller recalls another of Mercer's spies, Sabrina Galloway, so she's your next clue to finding out what he has planned. Father Guerra says that Blackwatch is holding a security briefing about her later that day, the same briefing that the pilot mentioned from before, and so you need to infiltrate this briefing to learn more. The briefing has been postponed until an infected attack is curbed, so you need to use an APC to go stop that first. Once you're finished, you tune into the briefing and learn that Blackwatch knows that you and Father Guerra are in the green zone. They believe that your next target is Sabrina Galloway, and you're her security detail. Your next mission has you calling Father Guerra, where he says that Blackwatch is about to release a cure called White Light. Heller doesn't trust the cure since he knows that Mercer has a presence in Blackwatch, so you set out to investigate and make sure that nothing fucky is going on. Father Guerra thanks you for reminding him what humanity can do, which is kind of weird because he knows that Heller has only gotten this far because he's a living bioweapon. You head out to consume a Commander Gallagher in what appears to be another bog standard brain drain, and he stops you when you grab him revealing himself to be evolved. I take issue with this because he was standing right next to a viral detector and it wasn't detecting him, which is either an oversight or a way of showing that their strain of the virus is different than yours and Mercer's, so they can't be detected as easily. This explanation doesn't make any sense because you'll see later that the regular Evolve can still shapeshift, so it's likely just an oversight. You beat him down and give him the brain sucker experience and sap all his insight where you learn that something fucky is going on. White light is highly mutable, so it can be altered to take on additional properties, which would be like adding side effects to medicine. Consuming Gallagher grants you everybody's favorite power, the sword arm. The new mystery is why Mercer is protecting the cure for the virus, and boy what a mystery it is. I have absolutely no idea what this madman with his outspoken goal to raise an army of evolved could possibly want with this highly mutable cure that will presumably blanket the entire NYZ. So, it's time to put on our detective hats and start following the breadcrumbs. It just so happens that Blackwatch is moving all of Koenig's science crew into the Green Zone, being led by Koenig's successor, Dr. Archer. You need to attend a briefing held by Colonel Rooks to learn more. This briefing turns out to be a bust as Rooks and Riley are giving out minimal information due to all the security breaches you've caused. You do learn the location of the science team, so you make your way there to have a midday snack. 
Riley steps in to secure the second team of scientists, which gives Heller the bright idea of body snatching him to become Rook's second in command. You do this by hijacking probably the most overpowered tank I've ever used in a video game, trumping the thermobaric tank from the first game, and you learn that Rooks didn't trust Koenig and by extension the rest of his science team. It's important to note that nobody at Blackwatch knows what happened to Koenig because they didn't see you kill him so they think he just went AWOL. The next quest we tackle is tracking down Sabrina Galloway. You find her hideout, and she tries to turn on that feminine charm to persuade Heller not to kill her by saying that she can track the other Evolved, and she'll help you kill them if you let her live. She says that she can't track you or another Evolved named Roland, so she wants you to kill him to make things easier. Heller isn't swayed by the seductive tone of voice, but he is swayed by the potential to have a mole in both Gentech and Mercer's chain of command, so he threatens to pop a cap in her ass if she crosses him and sets off to kill Roland. Thus begins our game of Among Us 2012. This is my favorite quest in the entire game, similar to the helicopter support mission from the first one. You take the place of this nameless goon and get to listen to this dude named Starnes indirectly reveal that he's a psychopath. You know, I look at all these civilians and you know what I think? Fuck them. Fuck all of them. I'm sick of this rescue shit. You know, some infected chicks are still pretty hot if you pop a bag over their heads. Starnes, for the life of me, I don't know how you pass the psych profile. Your powers and abilities are disabled, so you can't accidentally alert the squad, and there's even dialogue for killing a civilian for a change. Jesus! Working with a civilian soldier, last thing I need is more paperwork! You also hear mention of something called Operation Firehawk, which the lieutenant reassures are just rumors. Then, there's the best quote in the entire game. Shit, dude. Have you been working out? I eat a lot of protein. Once you're done, you're free to gun down the VIPs and Roland stops you from consuming him, which Heller really should have seen coming because he's evolved and Gallagher literally did the same thing to him earlier. Roland gets away, so Sabrina's pissed. He calls you up later to chastise you for betraying Mercer, and then you move on. You get another call from Sabrina saying that Roland is hiding in an infected lair. You make your way there and a Hydra pops out to prevent you from entering it. You kill it to get inside and then get to fight a Juggernaut with spikes. You kill that too and get the Hammer Fist ability, which pairs nicely with the blade. You lead the lair, kill some tanks, and then fight Roland, whose gimmick is that he can send spikes out of his body like a sea urchin or a less interesting Cyndaquil if you fancy the video game analogy. Once he's dead, because spoilers, you kill him, this upgrades your shields to send out spikes that do damage when blocking. You call up Sabrina afterwards to tell her that you're a sea urchin now, except Heller is an asshole so he insults her instead. Heller puts on his Lieutenant Riley costume and calls up Rooks to ask for Dr. Archer's location. Apparently, her and her entire team vanished after Koenig died, so he sends you to the last known location of the last person to go dark, Dr. Gutierrez. You arrive at the scene and one of the smartest evolved in the entire game causes a distraction by turning a nearby Blackwatch goon into a hentai bomb before vanishing. You track him down and drink from his skull like a sea raider to learn how to do this yourself, then proceed with tracking Dr. Gutierrez. You follow the trail of consumable NPCs until you finally get the Doctor's location, then do a 3 on 1 evolved fight. You slurp the Doctor's think tank and learn that, surprise, Mercer and Dr. Archer are treating the white light with something. Heller has nary a clue what he's up to, so you kill the remaining guards and then move on. Rooks calls you and tells you that Dr. Archer turned up at one of the white light depots and that he wants you to forget about it and get back to command base. You ask which depot she turns up at and Rooks rudely says that he'll send you the report and tells you to move your ass. You do, just in the opposite direction. You infiltrate the depot and decide to force Archer into the open by blowing up the chemical tanks to cause a gas leak. I did this entirely with stealth and bio bombs just to prove that I could, but the dialogue doesn't change, which kinda blows. You flush out Archer, who proves that she is indeed a doctor, by activating the emergency ventilation, which you'd think would be the very first thing that they did. Granted, all the soldiers and scientists are wearing gas masks, which is why you need to stay in a masked form for this encounter, but I'm still surprised that nobody thought of that beforehand. Nameless Soldier number 2543 dies trying to protect Dr. Archer as she shows how serious she is by killing him for literally no reason. This fight goes the same with all the rest against the Evolved, with the added mechanic of Archer calling in hunters to fight you, which thanks to this game's revamped combat system makes this fun instead of frustrating, even whenever I needed to fight five at once. It really goes to show how much a good combat system can change things. Eventually, she'll get sick of waiting around and join in on the fun, and you get to literally eat her ass like groceries. Her memories reveal that she's injecting the white light with Alex Mercer's blood, shocking, I know, and you get probably the coolest ability in the entire game, the pack leader ability. This is a devastator move that allows you to summon hunters to fight for you like Archer could, and it really comes in a pinch when fighting bigger enemies or larger groups of the Evolved. When you decide you're finished, you can cause them to suicide bomb for one last bit of damage. You meet up with Father Guerra, and apparently neither of you figured out what they plan to do with the white light yet. 
Heller is smart enough to know when he's being lied to, but he's not smart enough to know what a gaseous substance that is easily altered to take on additional properties will do when mixed with Alex Mercer's DNA. They're using Blackwatch to release the white light, so you need to track down one of the containers and do a controlled release to see what happens. Father Guerra gives Heller the don't lose sight of yourself talk, which he immediately shrugs off, adding another tally to the tragic hero action movie cliches we've seen today. You roll up in your commander disguise and tell the scientist to release the gas for a controlled release, and whenever he hesitates, you tell the Blackwatch goon to do it instead, who does it without question. Isn't being a commander awesome? Well, that doesn't last long as the white light turns three of them into evolved and one into an infected. Truly, nobody could have seen this coming. I call in some puppers to help me out with this fight, and they get eviscerated almost immediately. Using the tried and true technique of parrying all their moves and attacking when you get an opening, you kill them, and Father Guerra suddenly realizes that Mercer wanted to spread the virus instead of cure it. I don't know where he got such a preposterous idea from, but it almost makes sense if you really think about it. You head to the nearby White Light Depot to make sure nobody tries to open the tanks, and get greeted by none other than Alex Mercer himself. He's not too pleased with you, but I can't imagine why. All we've done is kill two of his lead scientists, a couple dozen of his spies, and his right-hand man. I don't know, I feel like he's overreacting a little. He quickly gives you the smackdown, calls you unappreciative, and then tries to kill you, which reminds me of the sixth grade for some reason. Heller sees his life flash before his eyes, and of course it's the memories of his daughter that give him the strength to resist Mercer's attack and cut his hand off. Mercer does the whole now I'm gonna make you suffer thing that villains do when the plot isn't quite ready for the final boss yet, and he runs off. You're then greeted with another girthy boy, the big bad Goliath. This fight is really awesome, which isn't something I was expecting going into it. There are three phases of dismemberment that make it a challenging and engaging boss encounter. The Goliath frequently skips leg day so you can stun it and cut one of its legs off. It then switches to attacking with its claw arm, which will get stuck in the ground whenever it misses an attack. You then run up and attack that until you do enough damage to cut it off, usually taking about two tries to do. It then switches to using its giant club arm where it jumps in the air and tries to hit you with a ground pound, which will cause it to land upside down. You attack its head until you've done enough damage, and then rip it off. Killing a Goliath typically gives you an upgrade to your bio bombs, and I just really love this fight. The attacks are highly telegraphed, but it does enough damage to still require you to try and avoid it, and the dismemberment is an almost realistic way of fighting this thing. It makes sense to cut off its weak points instead of just giving it paper cuts and draining its health meter like you would in the previous game. The fight is designed to encourage you to get in its face and engage it head on instead of hanging back and throwing things at it. I'm sure you could still kill it this way, but I never tried it because it wasn't necessary like it was in the first game. It's also cool listening to this dude on the radio lose his mind as you kill it. Oh my god! Subject is... Subject... Fuck me! Did you see that? Did anybody else fucking see that? Holy fuck! Father Guerra calls you afterwards and says that the infected are trying to break into his safe house. You can tell by the melancholy music that's playing that this is not going to end well. The call ends just as they bust in, so you hurry back to find Father Guerra dead on the ground. You receive a call on his phone from Athena, who turns out to be Dana from the first game. She tells you to come to the Red Zone to meet with her and that she has information about your daughter. And so, with your plot to get revenge against Mercer renewed, you make your way to the Red Zone. Conveniently, Blackwatch now knows Dana's identity, so you steal a helicopter pilot's face and make your way to save her. You fly to the Red Zone and support Blackwatch as they track Dana's location. Once the information is decrypted, you get a copy of her information, which you use to call her and warn her that Blackwatch knows where she's hiding. She sends you the location to another safe house where you can meet up with her. She learned that Heller's daughter, Maya, is still alive and is being held somewhere in the Red Zone. Just like that, Heller doesn't care about Mercer anymore and is only concerned about finding his daughter. I would say I understand where he's coming from, but really, he should understand that letting Mercer and Blackwatch continue with their plans after everything he's learned isn't a good idea. Dana talks some sense into him by saying exactly that, and she says that she'll look for Maya while Heller goes and deals with everything else. Your first mission is to help Blackwatch destroy all the remaining white light canisters, which is a simple enough task. Blackwatch ignores you running around in combat form despite nobody hopping on the radio and ordering them to, they just forget about you until the white light is destroyed. I'm only pointing that out because I praised the first game for this during the Blood Talks mission. Sabrina hijacks your call with Dana to tell you that she's uncovered information about Project Firehawk, which you heard Psycho Starnes talking about while you were looking for Roland. You go meet her to discuss it and she tells you that you're looking for a Commander Cantrell to learn more. Heller very rudely tells her to go back to Blackwatch and get more information, despite her telling him that she almost got killed getting that much in the first place. I'll talk more about Heller's personality after I'm done with the story, but there's a big reason that people don't like him, myself included. You hunt down Cantrell to a military base that's on lockdown, so you start a fire by destroying the fuel tanks to flush him out. They evacuate him in a helicopter, which crashes in no time flat, thanks in large part to the evil birds flying around. Then you need to defend the crash site from various infected and evolved instead of just ripping the door off and grabbing him for some reason. 
You fight the scantily clad Evolve that showed up and get the Whip Fist ability. Cantrell decides to make a run for it, which means it's Chow time. You learn that whatever Project Firehawk is, it's gonna basically level the city and kill all the infected. You call up Rooks and learn that Blackwatch doesn't have Maya in custody, a different Federal Bureau does. There's a detective named Griffin who has the information you're looking for, and Rooks says how he wants to use Maya so he can bait Heller into a trap. Rooks tells you to leave it to him when you offer to bring her in, so you're not getting any help on this one. You track down and chase Griffin's helicopter, but some Evolve catch him before you can, so you chase them until they stop the fight. After you kill them, you guzzle down on Griffin and find out that they've been torturing or experimenting on Maya, but it's not clear which one. He calls somebody up and tells him to get her to Dr. Carson's lab and prep her for surgery. You call up Dana and she basically tells you that the writers couldn't be bothered to flesh out this new agency that Carson works for because they're not even given a name. Heller says he needs to ask her a favor so you head back to the safe house. Once you arrive, Heller asks Dana to watch over Maya if he's ever gone. She's understandably shocked by this and Heller tells her that there's nobody else he can turn to. Now it's time to go see Rooks and find out what we can about Dr. Carson. Heller's decided that Rooks has outlived his use by this point, so it's time to kill him. The scene goes like this. Yeah. So how'd it go last night? Oh, that's great. And how's my little girl? I don't know. There's a lot of variables. Another six months, maybe. I know. I love you too. Jesus Christ, Riley! You should wear a fucking bell! Sorry. I've got an idea. Can you get a fix on a doctor, Trey Carson? Carson works for a special bioweapons division out of Quantico. Where are you going with this? If we can find Heller's daughter, that'd put his nuts in a vice, right? I heard somebody in Rattler 2 talking about a Dr. Carson. I think he's connected to Griffin. So what? Going to lean on Carson? You got any idea what these government spooks can do to you? How bad do you want Heller? I'll let you know when I turn up. It's obvious by this point that Rux is starting to get suspicious of things, but let's back up and talk about the beginning of this scene. Making Rooks have a family is a very good way to make Heller sympathize with him, but it doesn't work so well on the player. Memories and black box recordings show that Rooks knew about Gentech experimenting on entire families, he constantly told the soldiers to ignore the plight of the communities, and he threatens to court-martial one who saved a woman from being raped. You could argue that he's disgusted by the experiments, by how he spoke to Koenig in the beginning, and you can even say that maybe he just doesn't want the soldiers to be distracted by what's going on around them so they can focus on stopping the virus, but even that doesn't make any sense because it's hard to even say what Blackwatch's goal is in the first place. If they're here to stop the virus, why are they injecting it into healthy people in the yellow zone? And if they're here to experiment on the population, why are they proposing operations like Firehawk that will level the city in order to stop the virus? The issue with making Gentech and Blackwatch based basically one and the same, is that the motivations get blurred and it's hard to determine what is even going on. Rooks is ruthless. He doesn't care about the citizens of New York, and I find it hard to believe that he's capable of loving anybody at all. If he was developed in a way that shows how he really does care about the city, but he needs to separate his personal feelings for the sake of the mission, then this would be much more believable. The problem with dehumanizing a villain is that it starts to feel artificial whenever you try to take it back. You can't have all these recordings showing how little Rooks cares about the people he's here to save, and then try to spark some amount of sympathy from the player by saying he has a family. It's not a very original or creative way of changing the player's perspective of your villain, it just comes off as a cheap emotional jab. And after playing The Last of Us 2, I know a thing or two about cheap use of emotions to try and humanize the villain. <laughs> You track down Dr. Carson and learn from his memories that they're transporting Maya out of the NYZ and that they won't know how valuable she is until they perform the surgery on her. You plan on using Carson's identity to infiltrate this new location, but first you need to fight another Goliath. Once it's dead, some Evolved hijack your helicopters, so you kill them too. Mercer wants Maya just to spite Heller, but also because she apparently has a unique genetic makeup, whatever that means. Rooks gives you a call and says he has more intel on Maya's location, so he asks to meet you. This next scene is pretty good, so I'll just let it play out. Riley, yeah, I'm here. Where are you? Right behind you, you son of a bitch! You must think I'm dumb as fuck! Disappearing all the fucking time, disobeying orders? Who got to you? Who got to me? Who are you working for? Ugh. God. Oh shit, that's how you knew. Riley's dead. All this time, you... It's been you! Brooks, all I care about is getting Maya back. 
Just stay out of my way. Please. It's not Shakespeare or anything, but it at least shows some intelligence on Rook's part, which I like. At least that little bit of humanization brought them to an understanding of motivation, and that's as deep as these characters are going to get in this game. You call up Sabrina so Heller can be rude to her again. There's going to be a high-level security meeting after what happened to Cantrell. She tells you to go steal the identity of a transport pilot so you can infiltrate the meeting. Heller once again tells Sabrina to go back to Blackwatch, except this time she refuses, which is good because despite her being a literal superhuman, they'd probably still try and kill her. And nobody wants to be an international terrorist, right? Escort the commander, eat the commander, make sure there's no more commanders, and you learn that Firehawk is going to level the city, which we already knew. You call up Sabrina, and she tells you that she just got back from Blackwatch and learned that they're going to use helicopters loaded with thermobaric rockets in order to level the city. I'd say a nuke would make more sense, but at least they went for something different. Your job is to destroy the helicopters, and you can do this either with your powers or by flying around in a death machine. I opt for the latter, and the quest is done in all of five minutes. You meet back up with Sabrina, where she once again tries to seduce you by saying you can move to Tahiti and become super secret spies together. I don't want to get between you and Mercer. Besides... I'd probably catch something. Once Heller's done telling Sabrina that she smells like Elizabeth Green at a fish market, you head back to Dana. Rook sends you a message on an open broadcast telling you that if you want Maya, you have to come and get her. He's holed up in the Gentech headquarters, so you show up to blast some ass. There's a steel door that's immune to your hammer fist, but conveniently, a juggernaut shows up just in time for you to kill it in cutscene and get the ability to control other juggernauts. But just this once. You protect them while they bust into the building, and you find Rooks in a hallway with two whole soldiers. He does that bad guy plot twist thing where he shoots his own men and tells you to take Maya and leave New York. I somehow feel like it would have made more sense for him to just call you again and say, hey, I have your kid, just leave, but no, let's be all dramatic and shit. Somehow Sabrina got there ahead of you and kidnapped Maya, because of course she did. How exactly she got inside, past the lockdown, past the guards, and into the room without being seen when we beanlined it here immediately after the broadcast is beyond me. But apparently Heller was right when he told Father Guerra that the bitch was crazy. Let all the fellows watch and take notes here. If she'll cheat with you, she'll cheat on you. Now it's time to hunt down Mercer and gang to get your daughter back. Somehow we just automatically know where they're at and we go straight there. Heller politely asks Mercer to tell him where Maya is. You're gonna tell me, either on your own, or after I skull fuck you and drain your memories out the hole! This is when we learn Mercer's grand scheme. Are you ready? Alright, here we go, here we go. He wants to take over the world because he believes that humanity needs to evolve. He thinks by infecting literally everybody in the world there will be no more conflict or disease, which is like saying if you scoop out everybody's brain then Twitter won't seem like such a bad place anymore. Apparently, the reason Mercer wants Maya is because her and Heller have a more resilient DNA than everybody else, so he wants to make her the mother of the new world. If this sounds stupid, it's because it is. But let's pretend it isn't for a moment and keep going. Mercer consumes all the nearby evolved, which makes him grow more powerful. Which is stupid, because they all share his genetic makeup, and the only reason you gain more power from consuming evolved is if they have a trait that you don't. Since Mercer is the source of the virus in the first place, it shouldn't be able to give him more power. What really pisses me off is that Sabrina was there and I never got the chance to introduce her to my hentai hands. She didn't deserve to go out the way she did, sucked into Mercer's body like a Duracell battery. She deserved to go out by being sucked into my body like a Duracell battery. What comes next is the best boss fight in the entire series. Mercer is a three-stage fight that is highly punishing if you get hit, but very engaging the entire time. He will switch through all of his powers, two at a time, and will immediately counter you if you try to use anything that he's currently using. Unlike the other Evolved, you can't parry his special attack when it tells you to dodge. You have to follow the quick time event or you die. This is everything I wanted Supreme Hunter to be, with patterns to learn and respond to in a real difficulty instead of an artificial one. I wouldn't have minded if Mercer had a larger health bar, but it's nowhere near the absurd amount that Supreme Hunter had in the first game. There's also nothing to consume during this fight, so any damage you take is permanent unless you have the upgrade that allows health regeneration in combat. Your ability to dodge and parry is tested, albeit to a forgiving degree, and it's all around a good fight that requires you to use all your tools at your disposal. Unfortunately, it suffers from the same issue the entire game has. It's just too easy. I played the entire game on hard mode and I almost never struggled. I only took one health upgrade because damage was easy to avoid, and consuming was forgiving enough to let me regain what I lost. I haven't played on insane mode since I only did one playthrough and it was locked, but there was never a single encounter that I felt I couldn't get through, especially compared to the first game. Despite this, I think the challenge of this boss was great and I enjoyed it immensely. 
At the end of the fight, you get a short quick time event that has you repeatedly severing Mercer's arms until he can no longer regenerate, and the last thing he says before you consume him is, welcome to the top of the food chain. His memories are uneventful as they're just a conversation between him and Dana where she tells him that he's not the person she remembered, which should be expected because it's been established that Alex Mercer is dead and this is actually Blacklight, assuming the writers didn't forget that detail. Once Tyler consumes Mercer, he sends out a massive wave of tendrils that span the entire city destroying all the infected in the process. If this sounds overdramatic and dumb, it's because it is. Let's play out the rest of the ending like I did for the first game. James! Thank God. Maya. Maya. Are you alright? That's it. That's the ending. The problem isn't really the ending itself, as much as the fact that nothing really felt like it was building to a climax. Despite how jumbled the video may seem since I had to describe two different quest chains that overlap with each other, I'd have a hard time pinpointing when the plot really reaches its boiling point. There's a serious lack of direction in the narrative. From hunting Mercer, hunting Blackwatch and Gentech, back to hunting Mercer, finding Maya, there's no structure to the game's story or a long-term goal like finding the truth in the first game. By the time you learn about Maya's existence, you only have about 2-3 to three hours of story left before it's over, and the ending has no finality. It doesn't feel like an ending. So this brings us back to the question, why was this game so hated by the fans? Well, there are a number of reasons. I've already talked about Blackwatch and Gentex changes, so I won't be revisiting that topic unless it's relevant to something else. What I will say is that I still don't fully understand their motivations in this game as they appear to be working against themselves in various ways. I brought it up before, but if Blackwatch wanted to stop the virus, they wouldn't be infecting healthy people, and if they wanted to help Gentech test the virus, then why did they resort to Operation Firebreak to level the city? There's still no answer to these questions, and there won't be answers to many more questions I have. Let's talk about Heller. Heller is an asshole to everybody. He shows no remorse for what he's doing, and he's only shown to have any real human emotion a handful of times throughout the game. I understand his motivation to find his daughter after he learns she's alive, but every other time he almost relishes in the people he kills. He doesn't even comment on the regular marines that he kills, and you'd think he would because he was one of them. He was in the APC in the red zone when Mercer killed his crew. So why doesn't he sympathize with them over Blackwatch? Compare this to Alex Mercer from the first game, who admits that he's a monster in the opening cutscene, frequently shows remorse for the people he killed, and generally didn't come off as bloodthirsty as Heller who is only a good protagonist compared to the antagonist surrounding him. I think a big part of why it's so hard to get attached to Heller is because he has no real motivation that the player can get involved with. Mercer wanted to know the truth, and at least in my case, so did I. I wanted to know what happened that was so bad that Blackwatch was sending kill squads after me. I wanted to know why Elizabeth Green was being held in isolation, and that search for the truth ultimately led to her escape. You shared in his goal to stop the virus because you were responsible for her release, and you wanted to put things right. Your quest for answers is quickly derailed into one of self-preservation, and eventually preventing a nuclear detonation on the entire city. The events of the story feel naturally guided because you're the one who set them all in motion. Heller doesn't get any of this. You find out that he wants Mercer dead because the infected killed his family, but then Mercer says that he's innocent. We believe him because he's the former protagonist, so you just set out trying to disrupt Blackwatch and Gentech's operations for no other reason than they're evil. Eventually, you get deceived by an evil scientist, so you kill him, find out that Mercer is spreading his influence everywhere, and move to the Green Zone to learn more. You learn that Mercer did release the virus, but you can't go seek him out and kill him because Blackwatch is still being a general nuisance. You meddle with both Blackwatch and Mercer's plans, which results in your ally getting killed. 
Not even a half hour later, Heller is willing to give up on everything to find his daughter, who for reasons unexplained survived the infected attack on his home and was kidnapped by an unnamed government bureau that the writers couldn't even bother to give a name. They want to perform surgery on a child for some reason that is specifically called attention to but is never explained, and this detail has so little information around it that even the wiki doesn't bring it up. So the confrontation with Rooks and Sabrina happen, you try to save Maya, but she gets kidnapped again and taken to Mercer, and all of a sudden you're at a final showdown. The story isn't thoughtfully guiding you to this massive encounter against your former protagonist, whose motivations we'll talk about in a moment, it's a story that has you doing things to learn things so you can do more things. The twists don't go anywhere, the details are never explained, and there's never a chance for you to really immerse yourself in Heller's motivations. Because really, he never had a plan. You don't know where you're going, so you don't know when you get there. And by the time you do, it feels like the story flatlined hours ago. In a way, Dana's last words perfectly exemplified how I felt at every step of the story. What do we do now? There's no finality to this game's ending, so it's hard to feel like anything more than a waste of time. While we're discussing the plot, we might as well address the elephant in the room. Mercer isn't an interesting antagonist. Mercer isn't an interesting character at all in this game. The change in voice actors certainly didn't help, but very little is recognizable about Mercer in the game besides his outfit. The way he talks is different, his attitude is different, but above all else, the things that made him the most unique are now gone. Everything about this game is black and white, even the cutscenes, but one of the things that made Mercer interesting was his moral grayness. He wasn't a hero, but he wasn't a villain either. You could consider him an anti-hero, but he never really cared about helping people, he just thought that going nuclear was too extreme. And yet he wasn't only out for himself, either. He wasn't ignorant to the plight of others, but he isn't the type to try and step in and stop every petty crime, just the major ones. He wasn't altruistic, but he wasn't entirely selfish, either. He was the ultimate centrist, and that's a quality you seldom see in a protagonist. Then there was his true identity, the fact that Alex Mercer is actually dead and the person we see now is a living embodiment of a genetically engineered virus, an artificial creation with the appearance of a man that is so convincing that even it believed it to be true. Mercer isn't a superhuman, to be that he would have to be human at all. He's something that shouldn't exist and yet there he is, and the combination of all these traits are what made Alex Mercer's character so hard to define. He's an anomaly, a living weapon that gains sentience and he accepts that. Mercer knows what he is, and he knows what he isn't. But in Prototype 2, that personality is dead. Instead, we get the superhuman with a god complex, the evil mastermind who wants to burn down the world and rebuild it in his image. And we've already seen a villain like that in the very franchise that Prototype tried so hard not to be. This isn't Alex Mercer, it's Albert Wesker. 2009 was also the year of Resident Evil 5, and Albert Wesker is the main antagonist. He's a superhuman with a god complex, somebody who wants to infect the world with a deadly parasite that will force humanity into its next phase of evolution. He wants to tear down the old world and build a new one with him as the supreme ruler. Whether intentional or otherwise, the writers turn Mercer into Wesker, with a weak and uninteresting world domination plot that doesn't fit Mercer's character. He could have been a good villain, but just like Blackwatch, they stripped him of all his grayness and made him cartoonishly evil. I'm not sure how the story can be salvaged without major overhauls to the plot, but I know exactly how it could have a much more interesting antagonist. Mercer could have been an interesting villain if the writers would have taken his motivations in a different direction. Mercer is a virus, and from a biological standpoint, viruses aren't considered living things. The only real goal or desire a virus has is reproduction. The problem is, they can't reproduce on their own like other organisms do, so they need to infect a host in order to do it. The plot could have adhered to Mercer's anomalous personality and turned his edginess into full-blown nihilism. As an artificial creation, what would he truly have to live for? Any human limitations are irrelevant to him, and he has no true ideals to fight for. He could still spread the virus, but not out of malicious intent, but because it's in his nature as a virus to reproduce and it would be a desire that he fought for as long as he could before eventually giving in. Eventually, he convinced himself that being the leader of a hive mind is what's best for humanity, and that he isn't like Elizabeth Green because he's not trying to simply burn down the world. He would justify his actions not because he thinks he's superior to humanity, but because he needs to convince himself that there's a reason for what he's doing, and he's not just giving into a base instinct that derives from the part of him that's less than human. A villain who knows what he's doing is wrong, but his motivations are out of his control, so he turns to the one thing that humans have no shortage of. Excuses. This is a motivation that everybody can understand. 
and you might even feel some amount of sympathy for him. The realization that as attached as you are to Mercer, he's exactly what Randall called him, a biological bomb that's waiting to go off. He's the offspring of science going too far, and as much as you'd like him to disappear into the sunset and live out the rest of his days in peace, it's just not something he's capable of doing. So you need to step in and put him out of his misery, because his very existence is a threat to humanity, despite the fact that he has no control over what he's doing. You may not want to fight him, you may not want to put him down, but you do anyways because you know that he's suffering and there's no way to save him, to bring him back to the light. By killing him, you're not just doing what's best for the world, you're doing what's best for him too. Like euthanizing a family pet that you don't want to see go, but don't want to see suffer any longer. I don't know about you guys, but this sounds like a much more compelling antagonist to me. The Evolve could still exist as Mercer's cult following, just like they do now, but Mercer himself isn't a fanatic. Because that's what he is in the second game. The reason Prototype 2 is so hated by the diehard fans is because of the mishandling of so many characters. Blackwatch, Gentech, Mercer, all morally grey entities that have been forced into fanaticism. The only recurring character who hasn't changed is Dana, and she barely gets any time in this game as it is. People just do evil things for the sake of being evil, and even the new protagonist fails to capture that same moral greyness that Mercer did in the first game. Sabrina Galloway is as close to a morally grey character as we get, but she's so obviously out for herself that it's hard to feel like there's any real nuance to her motivations. It's obvious that the writers didn't have an interesting story to tell, so we just get this cliché, overdramatic sob story that doesn't feel like it has any real themes, at least not any that I could work out. The story doesn't feel like there's a point to it, so it just leaves you feeling disappointed and dissatisfied. That's why people didn't like this game, and after playing it again, I really can't blame them. Prototype 2 does many things right, but the story is not one of them, so even though I enjoyed the game much more than the first, I enjoyed it for its combat and bosses, not the story. I would recommend the first game over the second for an interesting narrative, but be ready to do 31 uninteresting missions with one okay boss and three terrible ones, and a slew of frustrating combat encounters. I would recommend the second game if you want a short, action-packed sandbox with engaging and satisfying combat, interesting boss encounters, and a world you can just run around and kill things in. I wouldn't recommend ignoring the story altogether, but don't try to get too comfortable because it'll be over sooner than you expect with little to no build-up. And it's likely to leave you with a bitter taste, too. I wish that Activision would either task a new studio to make a third game or just sell the IP, because I would like to see Prototype make a comeback. A brand new Prototype game with modern mechanics and updated graphics would be amazing. And with the fans almost 9 years removed from the last entry, I don't think anybody would think twice about buying it despite the second game's shortcomings. But, as it stands, Activision has no intentions of doing that, and it's a real shame to see another franchise with heaps of potential fall into obsolescence. Maybe someday we'll see something come out of it, but for now, Prototype went out with a fizzle, and it's likely it'll stay that way. Thanks for watching, guys. The first half of this script came together in like six hours, and the second half in several days, which shows you just how difficult it was to really organize my thoughts on the second game. My next video is going to be over the entire Metro franchise, including the books, so I have no clue exactly when I'm going to get that finished. I've already read the books, but I haven't started on the games yet, so it's probably a good thing that I got this video out two weeks sooner than I anticipated. As always, I try and have it out in a decent time frame, but I honestly have no clue how much there will be to talk about, at least with the games. I have more than a few things to say about the books, especially the sheer number of grammatical errors I found in all three of them. As always, if you enjoyed this video and got this far, then feel free to leave a like and consider subscribing. Every little bit helps, and I'm honestly surprised that my videos get the few amount of likes they already do. Otherwise, I really hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one.